welcome everybody to this uh, seminar on uh, uh, innovative technologies um, for African farmers improving smallholder productivity. Um, it is a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Segnet Kelemu here to SEI, uh, where we are also celebrating actually that she will be uh, um, included in the Royal Academy of uh, Forest and Agricultural Science this evening, um, and which brings her to Stockholm tonight. Um, we have um, at SEI collaborated with uh, Dr. Segenet's Institute for a number of years, and we are both. Uh, so, ISIPE is the host of an important program called BioInnovate Africa, which is exactly doing what this seminar is about, um, thanks to uh, the excellent leadership of Segenet. This has had a very successful phase uh, too now under ISIPE's leadership. We are very happy about that. Um, here at SEI, we have recently begun a new strategy, which uh, looks like this. It's for a five-year strategy, and where we have a very strong commitment to delivering impact in the areas that we will discuss today. So, under <coughs> one of our big three themes are sustainable resource use and resilient ecosystems, where we will be working on effective bioeconomy strategies, uh, both for national and regional policy and planning, and also more productive, resilient, and sustainable practices in the agricultural sector. And the work of, um, of BioInnovate and of ISIPE are critical components of this uh, agenda, of course. So it's really uh, exciting for me to have you here and to start this seminar. But I think instead of me going on forever here, I'd like to invite uh, the first speaker up, uh, Dr. Eva Virgin. Welcome. Uh, do I take that mic? No, I have this, yeah. right. Yeah, okay, friends and colleagues, welcome to this, this seminar and, and joining Hans with Monster saying that uh, <coughs> also welcoming our, our uh, c celebrity or our special guest here, Segret Kaleme, Director General of ICIPI. We have a very exciting program uh, for these next three hours. <clears throat> where we're going to talk about the bioeconomy strategy for East Africa a bit. Uh, second, it's going to talk a bit about uh, <clears throat> the role of ICIPI in, in transforming and innovating smallholder pr production in Africa. <clears throat> we're going to hear about precision farming in, for African smallholders. We're going to hear about uh, soil information on different scales, modern technologies on that for small scalers in Africa. We're going to hear about that sort of enabling framework for, uh, uh, fostering innovation for smallholders and, and uh, what we do in Sweden to support that uh, uh, as well. And then we're going to have a discussion uh, <clears throat> uh, with, with speakers and with the public here on, on what, was, what was, has been presented and, and what do you think is, is needed to sort of uh, insert or, or add to that, uh, to those issues. So without further ado, I will go into uh, the first presentation here, trying to see if I can find that one. Uh, <clears throat> there it is. So I will talk about <clears throat> um, two of my favorite subjects, um, <clears throat> developing bioeconomies, and I'll just take this one for clocking myself, and uh, and East Africa, <clears throat> which is very close to my heart. <clears throat> so, so by economy, for all its its pos potential possibilities to to support sustainable development, uh, and for <clears throat> my passion for East Africa, for all its its beauty and all its opportunities. So, combining those is actually quite exciting, and I hope to share a bit of that excitement. And a bit of those sort of um, a bit of that passion for for East Africa with you, within these uh, short 15 minutes. Just defining the bioeconomy, which means a lot for a different type of audiences, but but 
the global bioeconomy summit defined the, the bioeconomy in a, in a type of a global perspective as the production, use, conservation of biological resources using knowledge, science, and technology and innovation for products, processes, and services to, towards sustainable economy. Uh, and the key feature uh, in my mind with, with the bioeconomy is that we are using modern research, scientific research, innovation, knowledge, applying those to, the, to biological resources, <clears throat> not only for the <clears throat> production of food, feed, and fibers, but also for an increasingly, uh, for a wide range of, of, of increasingly interesting uh, industrial products uh, and value-added products with application in many, many sectors, pharmaceuticals, energy, industry, chemicals, etc. <clears throat> So the global drivers, in a sense, is what, that what we are able to use the tools of the modern bioeconomy to support the circular economy, economy a growth based on renewable resources, the green growth agenda, supporting uh, a growth combined with ecological and social sustainability, the low carbon economy agenda, uh, mitigating climate, climate change, replacing non-renewables, especially pet petrochemicals with the bio-based alternatives. So these are, are some of the drivers. I think, uh, for me, <clears throat> that, that one of the key features and, and possibilities is that we can use this toolbox of new technologies and new, new uh, business opportunities uh, to add value to primary produce and, and bio-waste. Um, <clears throat> So that, <clears throat> so in, <clears throat> to grasp those opportunities, we see that a number of countries in the world and regions are developing bioeconomy strategies. We have a number of countries in Europe, um, including the European Union, who has a very elaborated uh, version of the bioeconomy strategy, a newly developed one actually as well. The US being first on the, on the, <clears throat> on the scene has a very elaborated bioeconomy strategy in different versions. Latin America, countries in Latin America are developing. Asia, China, of course, India is developing. A number of Asian countries are developing bioeconomy strategies. Um, <clears throat> but in Africa, we only actually have one country which has its bioeconomy strategy, and that's South Africa. Now, taking a step back, uh, uh, looking at what SEI has been doing in, in East Africa and in a bioeconomy context, we have been involved in, in the bioeconomy development in East Africa since 1998, actually, where, where we together with CEDA and a number of, of um, <clears throat> uh, countries and actors and institutions in the region developed the BioEarn program, which was <clears throat> building a lot of capacity in bioscience innovation and policy development for the region. And that program then um, transformed into the BioInnovate program, which is running now, hosted at ISIPI. Um, <clears throat> And, and ongoing. So it's, it's, it's been a quite big investment for CEDA, and it's been two programs that has de delivered quite a lot in terms of capacity, more than 45 PhDs for the bio, bio program, including a number of, of um, MSCs, a lot of infrastructure equipment, a lot of policy development, and the BioInnovate program, as I'll talk a bit more about now, <clears throat> is, is a large number of, of um, of innovation platforms. Um, um, <clears throat> so both these programs are, are true bioeconomy programs. Um, and you see the BioInnovate program. Um, uh, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> the key, and the key features of, on the modern of, of, of the BioInnovate program are also the key features of, of a modern bioeconomy in Africa, where we <coughs> add value to primary produce, we add value to bio waste, we optimize bioprocessing, and the use of bioresources. Um, <clears throat> so these, the BioInnovate program is, 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 is active in six countries, Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Bur Burundi, and Rwanda. Um, <clears throat> so it's Eastern, Eastern Africa. Um, and, and as I said, the BioInnovate program has a number of of innovation consortia and innovation projects. And as part of, of the BioInnovate program, it's also policy development. And in, two, in, nine, in 2018, there was a call 
for the region to develop uh, ideas on how to develop a bioeconomy strategy. And SAI, together with a number of actors that you see listed here, uh, with East African Science, the Technology Commission, IASCO, the, the science arm of EAC, East African Community, I would say, formed a consortium and won that, that, that proposal to develop um, a bioeconomy regional strategy. Uh, the reason for developing that strategy is, is um, to inspire and catalyze the development of national bioeconomy strategies um, and subsequent policy development and interventions, but also to pr provide a platform for harmonizing um, policies and regulations and standards being developed in support of the bioeconomy in the region. So we have a platform for regional harmonization. And then, of course, also supporting a regional agenda for bioeconomy development, with, with potentially with supporting you know, uh, centers of excellence, uh, programs, such as, and, and where centers as, such as the SIPE is also playing an, a crucial role in supporting a regional agenda. <coughs> So <clears throat> taking a step back then on what is the situation analysis for Africa, for Eastern Africa, <clears throat> uh, we know that the population in Africa will, will, will uh, go from, from roughly 300 million to more than 815 million by 2050. So it's a very rapid increase of, of the population. So the region is under an, an enormous pr uh, pressure to, de to develop and to provide uh, that economic growth, job opportunities, and at the same time uh, protect its, its, uh, its ecosystem services and, and managing its bioresources and environment. So that, that sort of equation is not easy. At the same time also, the region hasn't been able to reuse trade really, not regional trade and not international trade as an engine of growth. Well, you see that, that between 88 and 2040, world agriculture exports, which is the mainstay of, of exports from region, rose from 83 billion to 1532 billion, <coughs> the, the global export. And the countries in, 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 um, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, we don't have the data for Eastern Africa, we'll get that, but now it's Sub-Saharan Africa in total, rose from 2.7 billion to 44 billion in the same year. But the share of agriculture export on the world global market actually in that period declined from 3.3% to 2.9. So really it's insignificant in the, in the global uh, sea, in the global, um, the global situation you can say. So one can say that, you know, the region hasn't been able to use that increasing, emerging uh, global trade as an engine for, for its own growth. Uh, but, but with the bioeconomy now and the opportunities opening up, we think that, that uh, there are a lot of possibilities to be actually to, to reverse that trend. We also know that, <clears throat> that we have a fairly inefficient use of bioresources in the region. <clears throat> we have a low agricultural productivity, uh, we have a large part of that fantastic bioresource bio uh, potential in the region, uh, very under-researched, underdeveloped, and, and underutilized. Um, picture of sorghum, a fantastic crop, very, very underdeveloped under in some sense. And, but also, we have some parts of the, of the biodiversity which, which is vastly overused, which is some part of the biomass, wood biomass, and charcoal production leading to, to huge deforestation problems and, and, um, and indoor pollution, etc. So, so, so that sort of um, uh, inefficiency is, 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 is also an opportunity to be reversed to something uh, much more efficient. I think one of the keys actually is when you look at the region, it's a very low, very, 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 very low degree of value addition to primary produce. Most of the agriculture produce is in the formal sector, ends up like this on the roadside or in informal markets, not processed at all, uh, or in heaps like that, uh, also not being stored, not being converted in, into products, 
and, and lots, of it, lots of it wasted, of course. Or as bio-waste as this uh, from a pine, um, or it's, I think it might be a sisal factory, where it do doesn't use its waste at all, it ends up as, as a problem. Uh, so adding value, converting that waste into something useful, is an enormous potential for the, for the region. So we have expanding markets, we have these 800 million plus people in the, in the region, com uh, con uh, constituting a huge opportunity. We have an increased scientific capacity, which we know is there. We know that a large number of, of PhDs, as normal highly trained uh, uh, people in the region, we know that as an emerging youth eager to be the new entrepreneurs and eager to be be active and and uh, entrepreneurial in the, in in the, in in and and uh, <clears throat> be part of a new bio, of a new economy a new bioeconomy and we have these vast resources both in terms of water actually and in land uh, of course there's a lot of problems in the region but there's there's a lot of resources actually <clears throat> which are not in use today uh, so there's a lot of possibilities actually so we have this strategy and we're going through I have to speed up, actually. <clears throat> so we have to go. Th so, so the strategy is being now being being uh, developed under in the version two, and it's being. Um, uh, we have this regional stakeholder forum where we we have get input from the strategy from the various national groups and also in regional settings. So it's under development. Development and there's uh, there's a number of session uh, sections. Just just giving you a, a, an idea of these sections. Uh, one of the, the key sections is what, what we are trying to describe, what we think that the bioeconomy uh, bio can bring to the region, trying to sort of uh, make uh, uh, the state or, or sort of uh, develop a platform for, for policy making and, and, uh, and uh, intervention and, and the importance of the bioeconomy for, 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 for governments in the region, saying that, okay, here is you have an agenda where you can, where can, you can support sustainable industrialization, green growth and the circular economy. You can have new models for bio-based production. Actually, the, the, the low level of industrialization in the region is actually an opportunity for the region to build new uh, structures. And we, we don't have to sort of <clears throat> uh, rebuild what's already there as we have in Europe, because we have a lot of uh, pushback from the chemical sector to convert. So now actually the Africa can actually build something new uh, and jump, leapfrog into new new sort of industrial structure. Linking small scale farmers and buying entrepreneurs from that un unprocessed products to value chains to new markets is a huge possibility to improve productivity. Supporting the health sector is a huge uh, uh, possibility as well. And the new uh, array of new bio-based products based on that fantastic diversity um, in the region, creating an engine for job creation and, and, and employment, and new clean forms of clean energy, of course. I'll come into that. Uh, so the suggested priorities going through this very quickly, is one of the key, of course, is agriculture and food security related pro pro uh, priorities. Improving productivity, lots of things that can be done here. The value addition, we talked about the food crops and li livestock products, but also this, the novel functional food and feed products, which is an expanding mar market, uh, very much so internationally, but also in the region with functional food additives and, and, and food conditioners, etc. The novel oils, edible essential industrial oils, the novel protein sources, and I guess maybe we'll hear something about the insects uh, and microalgae, which is also um, a quite considered, uh, considerable, um, provides considerable opportunities, um, and biopesticides and, and um, biofertilizers. <clears throat> um, the linking of the, of the bio farmers we talked about, the biopesticides and biofertilizers, uh, today the pests and diseases is one of the major problems and, and the set and the, the what sort of um, setting back the, the productivity in the re region. And, and we also see the emerging uh, biopesticide market, not only in East Africa, but globally. So if we can have the region investing in its own biopesticide production, uh, regional and local 
it, it provides a fantastic opportunity both to improve the productivity of agriculture, but also to create job and a new industry for the region. <clears throat> With the health-related uh, priorities, we have the industrial pro uh, priorities, I said, sustainability, I'll come into that. The health, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, we have a lot of disease burdens in Africa, and, uh, and an underinvestment, in, and uh, also uh, the drug production and, and the vaccine production is, m most of it is done in the north. But here we have an opportunity with new technologies, with new knowledge, using um, a, a quite strong foundation of institutions in the region to produce new uh, pharmaceutical products and new drugs and health products, uh, also to do bioprospecting and using traditional knowledge to pro provide a set of new or a new base for, for, for a health and, and industry in the region. Creation of, of uh, new bio-based products in support of job creation. Uh, we have all the green chemicals that can be created from, from bio-based products, uh, providing a number of, of, of products. I'm just going into one. We, we see an enormous uh, need to, to build new housing and new sort of new buildings in the region. We have a rapid urbanization. And, and we also see in the bioeconomy uh, 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 increased use of bio-based uh, material, not le least here in Sweden, where wood is replacing cement and steel, and you can you can do all these you know composite wood materials and make it more stronger than steel, but much more lighter. So the region has the pot potential to create its new industry for new bio-based construction material, being supporting that new new. Uh, the new infrastructure of the region. Bioplastic, this is interesting because the, the region is, has a, all, all the countries, not all, not all, but most of them, have very strong plastic bans. Like in Rwanda and Kenya, you're not even supposed to bring a plastic bag into the country. So that creates a momentum for a new industry creating bio-based packing material uh, <clears throat> for, for, for example, for food products. And this, create, this is a dual thing in the sense that you, you create an industry for bio-based plastics, but you also uh, provide uh, a basis for providing or, or safeguarding the, 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 the primary producer, the food, and keep it uh, sort of uh, fresh to the consumers, which is a great problem in the region. Uh, mo a lot of things uh, are, are, are uh, degrading on its way to the consumer. So here we... This, Quite exciting in a sense, and then of course we have the clean energy with with all the bio uh, biodiesel, for example, or the new uh, energy providers and energy carriers uh, using agro waste and bio waste for for producing biogas and new new types of energy uh, <clears throat> for the region, and converting bio waste to useful products. There's a lot of the agro processing industry in the in the region. Well, mainly in the in the, in the, in the process of making a survey in the region now, we, we find that it's very, very few I industries are actually doing anything with this waste. It ends up as, as environmental problems, polluting rivers and streams, freshwater resources, but that bio-waste is, is, is actually a huge uh, <clears throat> potential to be used in the, in the processes, uh, developing the various type of, of side uh, products or, or, or byproducts that actually could be more profitable than, than the main product sometimes. We have one, actually, we have one success story in BioInnovate, and the guy that was a banana refinery or a banana distillery, wine distillery, we, who invested in this major bio uh, agro waste. Uh, treatment facility, and his problem says, before waste was my main problem. Now my problem is that I don't, ha I don't have enough waste. That's what I, that's where I make my, mo I make my money on the waste. Uh, so that's a, a fantastic opportunity, actually. <clears throat> the problem, and basically I will end here, is that we are here in the region. There's a lot of R&D, there's a lot of innovation in its early stages that is going on, but we have enormous problems in the region to get that Industrialization. Here is a it's, it's a sigmoid curve where you have a process where products are are going into R and D. They're going into the more more stage where you have 
a lot of, of creating markets and, and demand for that product uh, through not least through policies but also to to for every investments and then you come to to a steady state situation where the the the, the product is accepted in the market and you have new a new set of policies in order to stabilize that that production and here's here's the in sense the industrialization where you have a, have a making an impact in terms in terms of productivity in terms of job creation and in most cases i would say we are here so the region has a lot of, there's a lot of things happening in the region but we have problems in getting getting up to getting up to speed <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so this is the last picture of my slide and this is the this is what we're polishing this is what we're going through in, in this in these stakeholder hearings is what, what are the the key messages for this strategy what are we to bring forward to the to the policymakers in the region and of course it's, it's the possibility to improve the value addition to, um, and bioprocessing and prim primary production of waste but also creating those structures for commercialization and industrialization of the bioeconomy that means the the bio uh, incubators, incubating private sector with academia, the triple helix models, but also agro-industrial parks or bio-industrial parks. It means also policies, incentives and interventions supporting that R&D sector, R&D process to be going into that sort of uh, exponential phase, creating market demand uh, through policies, through through standardizations, through, through um, <clears throat> Uh, through support or so and a major and we talked about that yesterday saying a major problem for the reading is financing this innovation financing financing this the r d process going into commercialization and there we i guess everybody scratches their heads and and wonders how how should we get that capital uh, and how should we raise that capital and there's a number of suggestions in the strategy where we go through. I, I don't, don't want to go into the detail, but we know that it's needed. The access to capital, credit fa fa uh, fa facilities, venture capital, and mechanisms to share financial risk is, is one of the keys. Friends, with this, I, I think I, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, and I thought, actually, that we, the, we, we can have maybe, if you have a quick question or, or a remark, we can have one or two after each presentation but then we'll end up in the in the after the presentations with with a lot with a hopefully longer session for discussions so if you have anything that you would like to ask or question yeah uh, two simple questions one is what is a triple helix yeah that's what's the first question secondly this sounds really really attractive and what is the response of the regional governments in eastern africa to this initiative yeah, I think I think the response has been has been positive. The problem is that 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 a large uh, many of the governments that, that we've been involved in say that this is very important. This is one component of of uh, modernizing the economy in the region. Some policymakers is you know the agriculture and bio based. We, we're leaving that. You know, we're leaving this. We're going into the modern industrialization. We're going to build a, you know cars we're going to build uh, trains we're going to build uh, new consumer products we live in the bio-based why should we be why should we be why should we be left in this and we are trying to say actually the modern bioeconomy is the basis for a green industrialization it's an opportunity because here is where you east africa has a has a, a comparative advantage Actually, so that, but I think over, overall it's a positive response and, and a lot of potential. But I think many are stuck in that in that vision of uh, we should get rid of, of not rid of we should decrease the dependence on agricultural products or byproducts and we should increase our investments in modern industries, manufacturing industries. You know, uh, and we say that actually biomanufacturing is is one of the keys, not the key, but one of the keys. Triple helix. Yeah, that's key, and I think that ha is happening. Uh, but but I think there, I think we, we have we have the academia, but academia I would say is a stronger part. But sometimes the, the private sector is is the weaker part, uh, because most of the private sector in the region and many of the private sector uh, region are are not able to to 
to finance an expansion or, or that rollout of, the, of that large-scale commercialization. So there's a lot of really fantastic emerging triple helix models and triple helix products, but few of them make it through that valley of death, in a sense, of, of innovation. But I think, um, yeah, I think the reading is learning, and I think there's a lot of, of very inter uh, encouraging examples. I, I, I think, with this, thanks, thanks for good, good questions. Uh, I'll leave the word to Segen Kalemu, Director General of ISIP, uh, and, uh, and actually who's been, uh, I met Segen at more than 13 years ago, uh, or 12 years ago, when you were, uh, yeah, uh, came from, from Colombia to take over ISIP, and, and you showed a lot of interest in, in the bioeconomy and the prospect of bioeconomy, and also a lot of interest in 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 the in the bioinnovate program, and and it, it was also very natural in the sense that it, it that, that ICP hosted it. So I think it's been it's been a wonderful journey for bioinnovate and be to be part of the of of the ICP, um, project portfolio. Okay, so I'll I'll try to find okay. your presentation. Okay. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Ivar, for uh, your commitment to Africa and your really great personality. And you have been uh, a good friend for a number of us. Thanks, Ma Magdalene. You you are really phenomenal. My daughter last night told me, Magdalene and you are really identical. Your sisters. <laughs> so. so uh, <laughs> Thanks all for your hard work also to get me here. So, um, yeah. so um, yeah, I can. So what is a... Uh, and you can, actually what you can do, I, yeah. I think it, you can this roll one? here if you want to. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. SUPE is an international center of insect physiology and ecology. And our mission is really to alleviate uh, poverty, to enhance food security, and to also contribute to the health of uh, uh, people in the tropics, uh, but using insects as entry point. So uh, often the uh, question that I uh, ask is that insects, how can the whole organization work on insects, these tiny things? Uh, but insects are really critical for uh, for people, uh, just to give you a, uh, some uh, uh, general facts about ICP. ICP was uh, uh, founded uh, about 50 years ago, so we'll celebrate our 50th anniversary on, on uh, April 3rd this year. Uh, so we are Stockholm Convention Regional Center for Reduction of Pesticides. We are also designated FAO designated center for. Uh, uh, vector and vector borne diseases in animals. Uh, we are a key and lead partners for WHO in uh, human health, in uh, mostly in malaria, and uh, we are also designated uh, uh, also a world organization for animal health uh, center for uh, bee health uh, in Africa. So we really live, uh, try to live by what we preach. Uh, so. Uh, we are 100% solar, so uh, uh, we were fortunate that we were fortunate to convince the government of Switzerland to invest in, in the infrastructure to make all our campuses 100% uh, solar. Uh, so we are not a member of the CGIR, but uh, we are a member of an association called ERCA uh, with nine NCGIR centers. So how we work, we work, uh, this is the only center focused on insects globally, but also that combines agriculture, environment, and health. So we work on human health, we work on animal health, and, and plant health, and we deal with the environment. We are also cutting across also, we are a major capacity building center also outside of any university. Annually, we receive up to 180 graduate students, half-half PhD and master's students, mostly from Africa, but uh, they can come also from anywhere in the world also. So I think last year there were eight non-African countries 
uh, students from eighth uh, in Africa. And uh, so this capacity building and institutional uh, building has been going on since 1983. Uh, so it's a really effective uh, program. And uh, many of our graduates uh, uh, still serve Africa. They are in the government's high level in uh, academia and in, in, in all in research and so on. Uh, BioNovate Africa, as uh, uh, Ivar has indicated, uh, we host it. So this is really actually a, a best fit uh, for BioNovate to be hosted at ICP. BioNovate BioN has been in Uganda, then moved to Kenya, uh, to, at Ilri uh, when I was a director of Becca, so uh, linked to Becca. Uh, so I think uh, it finally found a really good home at ICP uh, because many of the things that Baunovit does, we do also. So based on our success on capacity building and Baunovit also Africa program, uh, late in 2018, we were selected by the World Bank together with the governments of Africa and uh, the Korean government to uh, to host and run manage regional scholarship and innovation fund. Uh, so this is a, a program initiated by actually the governments of Africa. Uh, so who believe now I think Africa needs to invest in innovation, needs to invest in higher uh, education capacity, high quality PhD programs and boost the capacity of African universities uh, to do high quality uh, mentoring uh, across across the continent in five priority areas, including climate change, uh, food security, IT, mineral and, and some other. So, of course, we don't have capacity in all of these areas, uh, but we are managing the fund. Uh, so at the moment, close to $40 million, but we, uh, we, uh, our vision is to increase that fund by 2024 in four years to $65 million. So this is, this is a really great uh, also way for BioNovit to use it as a skills, it is a experience to jump also into West Africa. So uh, currently focused in six uh, Eastern African countries, but we are taking Baunovitz through the Regional Scholarship and Innovation Fund to West Africa as well. So uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, maybe uh, the Regional Scholarship Fund uh, man managers should come one time and give a presentation. It's a, a very fascinating idea, fascinating also uh, initiatives that uh, the African governments finally saw the light in this. Uh, uh, so I think, uh, why insects? I think uh, people always ask me, why insects? Why the whole organization have to to put this much money into insects? Uh, so I think there are, these are just basic reasons why we work on insects. Of the 1.4 million uh, animals, uh, species described, about 1 million are insects. They are abundant, they are everywhere. The vast majority of these are actually beneficial to humans to animals, to our ecosystem. Uh, only about 5,000 species are deadly. They transmit some of the deadliest uh, uh, diseases uh, to humans, animals, to crops. They directly cause a lot of damage to, uh, to, to crops, but the uh, vast majority, they pollinate our crops, they are hardworking far farm animals, they are beneficial predators that uh, uh, attack uh, harmful insects. They are great uh, indicators for environmental change, environmental health, you can actually use insects as indicators. They are great decomposers of, of both animal and human waste. And they play a major role in the food web for animals and humans, birds and, and, and others. So I will talk a little bit about that. Uh, they are also very, uh, beautiful part of the landscape. I mean, who doesn't like butterflies, you know? So, uh, so, uh, so this is actually my regret, and 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 is that why only ECP? I think there should be a lot of ECPs all across the globe uh, because of the importance of insects. Because literally, our lives depend depend on it. Uh, so. 
just to uh, to give you some, uh, some of you have probably have seen this slide, uh, but uh, ICPE perhaps is one of the best organizations I have ever worked on because of the relevance of what it does to the continent and globally, because of also the effectiveness of translating science into impact and making a difference in people's lives, and because of the quality of the science, uh, and, and all this combined also that this is uh, probably one of the very uh, trusted, most trusted organizations by governments and key players in, in Africa. Uh, so this is a, a technology developed about 20 years ago by CP scientists. Uh, it looks a very simple technology, but there is a lot of science behind it. So over 100 papers were published on this on this thing. Uh, we won multiple awards on this. The uh, United Nations Secretary General, uh, the, uh, Ban Ki Moon, at the time when he was a Secretary General. Uh, wrote in his report, this is one of the most innovative sustainable agricultural production system ever to come out of science. So this is basically, is, is this a pointer here? Is, is that this one or uh, let, this, let me try it. No, no, I don't know. So um, is there? Oh. <laughs> Take it off. Yeah? Okay, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, I can point here. I think. Yeah, this is this is maize. So this is a a magical plant called uh, Desmodium. So it is planted in a row inter inter in in uh, between maize rows. This is a grass. Um, also, uh, but planted uh, around uh, the maize plot. So this plant, Desmodium, produces uh, naturally compounds in the air. We don't smell it, but the insects smell it, and they don't like it. So they are repelled away from the 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 crop. So you can plant maize, you can plant upland rice, you can plant sorghum, whatever. Uh, so it protects the. Uh, the uh, the crop from the uh, from the pest the pest just runs away it doesn't come near this because it doesn't like the smell this the grass produces other set of compounds also in the air the insect smells it and they like it likes it so it is attracted to the grass it lays its grass it is uh, eggs on the grass but it doesn't it doesn't allow it to develop to the next stage so the insect learns the hard way that actually this is not a proper uh, a proper host for it. So this is a beautiful system. So this was developed for a, a, a so there is a, this is just, don't worry about it, it's a lot of chemistry. Our chemists have been busy defining all this, how it works, the whole system. So the first paper, I think one of the first was uh, published in Nature on this one. So, uh, so this was developed initially for a, for a pest, a major pest of this, which causes uh, annually $1.5 billion loss uh, across Africa. So we, we solved this problem. So we're happy with it because we can save this much for uh, farmers. But then down the road, we found out actually this system also controls uh, very bad uh, uh, weed, a parasitic called, uh, weed called Striga, this beautiful, beautiful uh, flower. Uh, so this was, wow, this is amazing. This is actually a much larger impact than the, even than the insect one. Uh, later then, we found out, actually, the farmers reported to us that uh, the system actually also controls aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is a major uh, problem across Africa and globally, it is uh, produced by fungi. So it is uh, uh, it is a carcinogen. At high dosage, it can kill people. It stunts children. It's really bad, bad stuff. And so it controls that. So wow, this is amazing. So we did all the research once. The farmers told us to how this is actually work working against that. 
Then in 2016, uh, there is an invasion of Africa by a new pest called fall, fall army worm, which came from South America, southern part of the United States, and then it came to Africa. So, so it was initially discovered, reported in Nigeria in 2016. By 2018, it, almost most of Africa went, and governments went crazy because uh, maize is a food security crop. But on top of that, this pest uh, has, uh, although maize is its favorite crop, it can attack actually uh, more than 80 species of uh, plants. And so it's really nasty, nasty uh, uh, pest. Uh, it, so uh, about 37 million hectares of field were affected across Africa. Uh, 3 million hectares, large scale, but uh, more than 90% were smallholder farmers. So, of course, then the whole uh, of Africa came to us. So you are insect center solve it. Well, but we have not been working on this uh, insect. So we work on insects that are funded, but we didn't have that. So, but I had to, we had to uh, scram funds from uh, this, from there, from there, and put 20 scientists to work on this. And uh, we found, we, uh, and so just to show you also the life cycle of this, the whole life cycle uh, takes between 31 and 81 days. It's really nasty thing. So you will have, so we started working, targeting each part of the life cycle. And so, uh, and I'm happy to report that uh, we found this push-pull technology also works for this also, because the pest is related to the original pest against which we for which we developed this uh, technology. But uh, since then, we developed also biopesticides that attack uh, the different stages of the eggs, the larvae, and so on of the uh, pest. So now we are uh, quickly into the uh, uh, registration uh, part. So we are working with different uh, governments because one of the issues is also the difficulty is also registration of a product across Africa. So what we are trying to do is simultaneously that uh, the, the, the countries to come together, or regulatory bodies, to simultaneously register the product. Uh, and we can test in a number of these countries, and then the process can be shortened. So um, now uh, Kenya is invaded by locust. So the Kenyan government comes and says, OK, uh, give us a solution. So, we, But we don't have solution out of our pocket. So this is... Uh, this is pests are extremely uh, dangerous and they are really uh, important. So the push-pull technology, uh, it works beautifully. These are these plants are also high quality forage for feed for uh, animals. So it is just perfectly made for a cereal uh, livestock production system for Africa. And so it works in Ethiopia, it works in Kenya. So nine. Uh, different countries in Africa have adopted it at the moment. So it's, uh, it is uh, an amazing technology. Um, just also to tell you a little bit about uh, malaria. Malaria is uh, an old uh, parasite, an old disease. It has changed the face of uh, history. Uh, more people have died over the years, uh, in the, especially in the old days, from uh, malaria and the human, major human conflicts combined together. Uh, so there's a lot of history associated, but the, the West has managed to eliminate it. Uh, so now malaria has become, remained to be the global South problem. And 90% of the burden is in Africa, even as we speak, every 80 seconds a child dies from malaria. And so this is one of our focus. It is transmitted because transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, so the world has made a lot of investment to really reduce even the incidence in Africa. Uh, it has, but now it has plateaued because the current existing methods of management of the the parasite. Uh, has plateaued, it no longer works because the mosquitoes are getting smarter. They are not uh, biting indoor, they are biting out the door, they are biting earlier. Uh, and then uh, there are also other residual also, uh, insects that are transmitting this also. Uh, so 
But there are other issues also that uh, people not, are not aware of how it happens. So one of the things that ECP has discovered is this invasive alien plant. Uh, this invasive alien plant, it's called famine, famine weed in Ethiopia. It is really bad food security uh, plant. It uh, also is, uh, it affects also if livestock cattle eat it, it affects the quality of milk. It is toxic. It is, uh, it reduces biodiversity. It is hard to eradicate. It uh, reduces uh, bee productivity. But nobody knew until we discovered that actually uh, this is called partenium. It, uh, it also, uh, it also is a preferred nectar source for mosquitoes. So uh, mosquitoes uh, don't live just on uh, uh, blood. So they need sugar source, nectar. They, they like sugar to, for fecundity, for flight capacity, for a number of reasons. They need that. So this is one of their uh, uh, preferred nectars. And uh, so we published this work in... Uh, 2015 or so is a part of a PhD thesis. So you can see here in Western Kenya, these are houses here. It's the whole area, their backyard, everything, the front yard is completely invaded by this space. This area is also endemic, uh, malaria endemic area. So things don't work in isolation. So there is an agricultural issue, which is a really reduction of a, a, a cause of a food security issue, but it's also a human health also a problem issue also. Um, so we are working on this one. This is our uh, uh, new discovery, actually, how this place in disease transmitting mosquitoes. Um, Recently, also, we discovered that uh, really potentially great, great uh, um, uh, malaria control measure, potentially. Uh, so mosquitoes that uh, harbor this fungus, microsporidia, uh, cannot transmit uh, malaria. And uh, also the beauty of it also is that the malaria, the uh, female mosquito, that has this fungus, it, it transmits it maternally through the egg, through the egg. So once the mother has it, it goes from generation to generation through the egg. So what that means is that actually we can use this to transmit it into a larger population of the uh, malaria uh, transmitting mosquitoes to prevent uh, malaria transmission. Because none of the mosquitoes that harbor this can be, can transmit malaria. So this is an amazing thing. So the paper is, will be out, uh, is already accepted in nature. It's a, 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 a key discovery. And uh, it is also, the, the beauty of it is also a young uh, Kenyan graduate student who discovered it accidentally. So we are really excited by the possibility of this. And so this has a very strong uh, blocking malaria transmission, blocking uh, uh, phenotype. And so we have demonstrated it uh, over and over uh, that uh, it is very tight. Once it has it, it kind of transmits. So it's, uh, it's beautiful. Just to switch gear also on uh, cattle. So uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has a large number of cattle, uh, but productivity is low. Uh, the milk quantity is low, the carcass weight is low uh, for various reasons. There is a drought problem, there is a feed, uh, quality of feed uh, problem. But one of the key uh, reasons why uh, African cattle are uh, less productive than their counterparts somewhere, uh, somewhere else is sesame uh, um, flies. Sesame flies are uh, found in Africa only. They are really bad. Uh, they are, uh, even in some authors, uh, say that this is a major reason why Africa's development is uh, arrested because of sesame flies. Sesame flies not only just affect animals, they affect also humans, they cause uh, sleeping sickness. But also they cannot uh, access large areas of arable land 
because of SFLI infestation, because cattle cannot live, people cannot live in those areas. So this is a really major thing. So SAP has been working on this. This is uh, one of our major focus area uh, on CSF lies. So we have, um, so it's not coming, okay. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a beautiful story here. So what uh, ICP, some of ICP scientists, is a Nigerian chemist who discovered this actually origin, and not a Nigerian, Tanzanian. Tanzanian. So cattle really suffer from CSF lice, but he observed that some wildlife, impala, zebra, wild beast, and water bugs cannot be touched by this uh, what, uh, CSF lice, even in heavily infested area. So he got curious, he started looking why that these animals can live freely, not touched by even one sesame fly, where cattle cannot even uh, dare going there. So he looked at, he collected uh, odors from the skin of these animals, and he looked at the odor, what is the odor, what is it constitutes. So he identified a narrowed down testing five compounds from the order of water bugs uh, that are emitted into, into the air. And uh, those are the reason why this, this uh, animal is not affected. So then, oh, this is great, so I think we can do this. So he characterized the, the, the compound, the five ones, could synthesize it in the lab, and uh, then, Isipe then designed with the engineers this metal uh, collar system, injected those compounds into the into the into this system, and then the animal wears it. Yes, problem solved. So the animal the the sesame flies cannot because they think this is water bug, not a cattle, so they won't come near it. But okay, it's not as simple as that. Huh? So I saved you all this chemical compound, whatever. Uh, because I don't understand it myself. So, um, but the, then what happens? Uh, what does the flies go after this? Then uh, uh, ICP again studied the scientists' the physiology of the insect, the, uh, everything else. So the insect is attracted to blue color, totally blue color. So. Uh, no, let me see. That one. That's the design. So the blue, so it goes to that, then it lands on the on the dark uh, fabric, then it's attracted to light, and then it's trapped there. But if you want to enhance the trapping, you, you put uh, under that simple uh, device uh, the urine of cattle. Urine of cattle, urine of buffalo is even better. Uh, so, this actually, this is a mass I can actually uh, take this and go with them, and you can solve that. So that was exciting, but then um, this was from the metal became too expensive to, for the farmers to buy. Uh, so because uh, if they, you have three, four, five cattle, you have to, to put still collar in all of this. Huh? So the original one, it costs around 40 US dollar. So it's, uh, it's costly for them. So now uh, some of our brightest young, young scientists design a very simple one from a canvas. You, you put the, the compound here, you soak it, you inserted it, uh, and then the cost is reduced to $5. Okay. So then it was a lot of time to register this uh, compound. We finally registered it. Now it can go into a market. So, so, so when donors fund us for one year, two years, three years, are you kidding me? This takes like 20 years to, from the discovery to get it up to this. So uh, it requires passion, it requires commitment, it requires patience both to do the research and do, also to get the funding. But so this is beautiful thing. Uh, so uh, 
I'm just really excited about this. So the, the compound comes in this, we can, we gave the technologies to a private sector so they can synthesize it, they can commercialize it. It is, and, but we are still, we still always give uh, also um, uh, technical back, backstopping as well. So, so hopefully uh, we solve all this, all the, the problem of CSE. Uh, so, so yeah, then the tourists, the, uh, this uh, Masai uh, Mara, the hotels, they ask us if we can also develop a, a necklace for people. They say, no, 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 we are not into, <laughs> we are not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so then it's uh, the, the yeah. So, but we need then uh, because just to produce a product. Um, although this is a blend of five compounds, which is difficult for the CSF light to overcome. But always you have to think resistance could be developed, like antibiotic resistance and so on. So we continuously look for a new one. So now we are looking for zebra. Don't worry, the zebra is not dead. Uh, just tranquilize it. So, uh, this is a, a student, a PhD student from uh, Nigeria. Uh, she's uh, trying to uh, collect order from the zebra. So she has published a paper now from her work that uh, the zebras have also similar compounds because the excessive lice don't like them. Uh, but she found one of the compounds is really different from the water bag one. So we are going to enhance that also the, uh, into the new version of the, the compound. But I think for now the five compounds can go. But uh, yeah. So just I think one last area I want to give you is uh, last year in May 2019, uh, there was a, a very a nice article by The Economist on uh, called title Mitty Planet. The planet, uh, what they, they are saying is that we eat too much meat, that uh, the product, the consumption of meat, beef from the 60s, early 60s to, uh, to the 2014 has almost doubled from 23 kilograms per person per year to 43 kilograms per, per person per year. And as incomes increase, middle, the middle class uh, uh, expands that this trend is going to continue, uh, that the demand for. But what that means is that uh, you have to produce more feed, more water, and, uh, and uh, use more land, compete with he, the human uh, need, grains, and so on, with, uh, li with livestock. The livestock currently consume 30% of the fresh water, 30% uh, of the uh, grains that we produce. They take enormous amount of fresh water also to, to hydrate. So is this a trend that we want to? How is, are we going to, with this trend, how are we going to, f to feed the expected 10 to 11 billion people? So this is not sustainable. And if you look at also green, uh, green ga uh, house uh, gas emission, uh, so there was an article I read some time ago that uh, if livestock is a country, it is a third most, also the third uh, uh, greenhouse gas emitter, uh, a third country equivalent. So, um, so although we, I have shown you that we work on livestock, on the hulls of livestock, but we are also looking for alternative ways also, how we can create also a futuristic uh, food also for uh, humans. But this is not a futuristic uh, food. So that actually about 2 billion people globally have been consuming insects for, for generations in Africa, Latin America, Asia. But most of these insects are collected from the wild, uh, which means that you disrupt the ecosystem, you over harvest, some of these are beneficial for the ecosystem, and, and so on. And also, it's often in all of these countries, it is women and children who go to the forest to collect. So, uh, so this is not a sustainable system. So these are beautiful colors. This is a, a market in uh, Uganda uh, of insect called Insenene, a delicacy in Uganda, but collected in the, in the wild. 
This is uh, just a map to show you uh, a recorded edible insect species in the in the world. You can see a really high density in uh, in uh, Mexico in in uh, this area in Africa is heavy and and elsewhere. So uh, this is uh, not uh, new, but this has been uh, going on. But what we want to change is to to mass produce uh, the insects and instead of people uh, collecting them from the wild but why not we make it mainstream the only country that mainstreams insects is uh, thailand and china thailand you can actually go into supermarket and buy whatever packet you you find so uh this is uh that in africa there are about 500 species uh, documented species. The really hot bed is in, in Central Africa, uh, although that across Africa that there is a wide range of also consumption of insects. Uh, just to show you also that the demand for feed is also high as we demand for more meat. So the feed uh, value annual global turnover is estimated at 350 billion. Uh, so the about up to 70% of the production cost of animals is, uh, is feed. Most of it is protein source. And the protein source are currently come from fish meal, soybean, uh, cotton seed, uh, and so on. So you'll have to, you need more land, more water, more labor to get this. Uh, so we, we want to change that to Introducing, but on top of that, also if you look at it, it's also beef production is not efficient. You need about 25 kilogram of feed to get one kilogram of beef, uh, and you only consume about 40 percent of the animal. There is for insect like a cricket, one kilogram of kit to produce, you need about 2.2 kilogram of feed, and you can consume about 80 percent of the insect, almost the whole insect, you can eat it. Um, and so, so when you look at it, this is actually a good way. So we looked at our chemistry labs have been looking at also the the protein content of all these insects. So about 96% of what uh, we tested actually outperforms the fish meal, the soybean, and so on in protein content and in quality of protein. Uh, we looked at also other contents of this. Uh, insects are really high source of, uh, of vitamin B2. Uh, xanthan, this is, you need something for uh, your eyesight, high, high quantity. Uh, zinc is really good source of zinc, better than uh, B for anything, uh, iron and so on. So this is really the future, I think. If we, what we have to do is just really set our, our head, the yak factor and, and uh, uh, the perception and uh, uh, try to switch to eating insects. Oil, just to give you oil, uh, uh, Ivar talked about oil, uh, novel oil. Oil is high again, high. We, we consume a lot of oil. The, the edible global edible oil uh, from 83.4 billion is expected to go to 130 billion dollar value by 2024. The skin care products, lotions and moisturizers and all this stuff, they use oil. So, and it is valued in 2018 at 134.8 billion dollar and it's expected to increase. Omega-3, you have heard omega-3 is good for our health and so on. Uh, that is uh, just one type only. The market value is expected to go to 3.7 billion. So all this mostly come from, uh, with the exception of the omega-3, the others come mostly from uh, plant, plant-based oils. So again, the same story, where is, where is the land coming, where is the, the water coming, and so on, to meet this demand. So we, one of our uh, uh, partners who uses our technology, our insects, to produce uh, feed, uh, protein source for uh, chicken and for uh, fish, 
uh, told us actually one of the reasons, uh, one of his problems is that when he was processing the insect, it is too sticky because of the oil. And I did not know actually they produce oil here. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. I have time. How many? Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm finishing. Yeah. So we started then looking at the oil content, and uh, we were astonished. A lot of these edible and non-edible insects have a lot of oil. Not only that, but uh, like the uh, the locust and the uh, Ugandan delicacy insect and so on, they have also all the three omega-3 also. Uh, so if you we compare it to olive oil, to sesame oil, then these are much better. Uh, they have vitamin E, and so a lot of the cosmetic industry actually, they put infused vitamin E uh, into the lotions, saying that it uh, it's anti-wrinkle, anti-whatever uh, uh, lotion. So this one has all. Uh, they have a variety of antioxidants. Uh, so uh, it is a very healthy quality oil. So for people who don't want to eat, Directly the insects, this is also another source of it. But once also uh, you remove the oil, the remaining is also high quality fiber, high quality protein, high quality of other things also you can use. So these are some of our products, insect based products that, that are out with our uh, partners. So you can uh, buy them as now. So all this work would not have happened without our donors. So we have uh, over the years, we have also expanded uh, our donor base. We have expanded also our uh, funding. Uh, uh, last September, we got one grant of $55.6 million to get, again, the technology out to reach the thing. So we we have increased our capacity. We have increased our uh, uh, innovation system uh, and so on. So uh, we are very grateful to uh, the people. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Sainz, for uh, for telling us a lot about these very exciting things <laughs> happening at at CIPE. We have uh, time for some very quick questions, just on on Sainz's talk here. <clears throat> Anybody, Christine? Hi. It was very interesting with many, many big, big challenges and impressive solutions. Uh, and you mentioned in your last slide that. Uh, I think it's on. Or it's on. I can try and speak up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, so I just wonder. Uh, you mentioned you have a a big grant now to bring it out to the end users, and I wonder how. How will you work with that? How will you? So this uh, uh, this grant was for one country, for Ethiopia, uh, to create uh, to use bees, beekeeping, bee products, and uh, silkworm to create jobs for use. Uh, use. So basically, our technology to to translate it to to impact. So. But the, the key is not whether, um, the challenge is not whether we can uh, uh, translate that, we can. Uh, my worry and my staff tell me not to worry is whether we can spend $1 million a month in Ethiopia. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, my staff tell me no problem, we hire additional 70 people, so no problem we can spend it, so we have to see whether they are spending it. But. Uh, yeah, but I think we we will do that, uh, scaling out those things. Uh, so it's a it's a beautiful thing, but uh, I cannot go explaining how it is. Uh, so the B uh, the B component is beekeeping, wax production, and all those things. But I think we are combining it also to vegetable production, so that the the bees can pollinate the the, the crops. They get also the good quality nectar to produce more honey, uh, and everything else is used. But uh, there is also a component of silk production. Uh, so it's outgrowth scheme where the use are contracted by the silk factory, and they produce that. Uh, every two weeks they get a check uh, from the factory, and they, they give the silk cocoons to the factory. It's a, a very beautiful system that I visited it. Uh, it, was, it was nice, yeah. Very satisfying. Yeah. 
and the, the, the byproduct from the silk, because the silkworms, they consume a lot of uh, leaves. The byproduct also is high quality fertilizer also. They, uh, they, they, their poops go into their vegetables. So it's, so it's a very oil round system. Yeah. <coughs> yes. I, I think it's fine, you can... Mm. Um, I have a range of questions, but uh, for the sake of time, I'll stick with a yeah. few of them and I'll take with you later. Um, thank you for this excellent presentation to begin with. Um, my question is, uh, I know Push and Pull works. Mm -hmm. I know that I visited one of the projects of the Institute for Sustainable Development, but what begets me is why it's not scaled up in, yeah. in the country. Yeah. Uh, that's one question. Second question is, I have a challenge with this uh, SFLA. I have a challenge with your success. Mm -hmm. Because because of these flies, areas were protected from expansion by um, by agriculture and pastoral systems. Now people had, are cutting the had, trees. Yeah, we had areas protected <laughs> for wildlife. Yeah, yeah. Now you are solving that uh, expansion. In wh what are we going to do with the expansion? Wh what about wildlife? If I am a wildlife, yeah. you know, that's a danger for yeah. me. So, uh, no, that's a good question, but I think um, technology alone is not, a, is not going to solve a, uh, all development issues. Yeah. When you solve something, there is some <coughs> other unfortunate thing coming. Uh, so, when, uh, when the BT uh, um, soya, uh, no, not BT, uh, the, uh, the round, it, Roundup, Roundup ready maize. So yeah, a Roundup ready uh, soya uh, became really rampant. So, and it was making a lot of money the, uh, in South America. That uh, uh, the uh, Brazilians started actually not reducing but slashing more uh, forests so that they yeah. they can plant more. So I think policy matters here. Uh, policy really matters also. Like I think in Ethiopia now. The new prime minister says we have to plant four billion trees. Uh, so it has to come with that also. Some area I can protect. Uh, so when I lived in, Co in Colombia, there are areas I, I went out of the city limit to build a house. Uh, but so I bought a, a, a large land with forests. But the part of the forest, it's the land is mine with the forest, but it's really not mine because that's a protected uh, uh, land, so I couldn't cut uh, any of the trees. Mm -hmm. So p that type of policy has to come in, in, in play so that, uh, that okay, that it is made now, the CSF fly is solved, it's made accessible, but uh, don't cut the trees. So other than that, I, I, <coughs> I don't know how to, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I, I think that's yeah. that's a sort of mix of policies and yes. technologies, yeah. and and sort of weighing and balance that uh, mm. I think is 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 uh, is important. I think we have to move on. Thanks okay. a lot, and I think there will be more time a bit after the, all the presentations to discuss. The, um, so now, thanks a lot, Sainer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will. I'm presenting Johanna Wettelind from the, the Swedish Agricultural University. Of, uh, Swedish Agriculture University, <laughs> <laughs> as a uh, uh, close co colleague of mine, and she will talk about, um, let's see, she will talk about <clears throat> precision farming, and I'm, I must say, I'm a farmer myself in Sweden, and for us precision farming is the thing, but, and then you think precision farming in Africa, and here you're going to hear a lot about precision farming in Africa. Can I use a phone? Or something to get keep track of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. Or, uh, I'll, 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 yeah. Or you maybe can have you my can... phone. Yeah. Or you can help me just keep. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for letting me come to speak about my favorite topic, precision agriculture. I mainly work with precision agriculture in a Swedish context, but I'm also working, maybe not exactly with precision agriculture, but I'm uh, part of a program called Agri4C, Agriculture for Food Security 2030, 
which is about translating science into policy and practice. Uh, so it's a bit like, it's about taking the knowledge like ICP has done and getting it to work where it should be. Uh, so as Ivar said, I'm working at uh, SLU and at the Department of Soil and Environment. And I'm an agronomist myself in my background. I can't do that. Let's see if I can do. I can do like this. Oh, I tried. So this will be in on a particular, a rather small thing compared to the the talks before. But I don't know how familiar you are with precision agriculture. So I will actually go take a step back and explain a bit about precision agriculture. And. Actually, last year, the International Society of Precision Agriculture, uh, they agreed on a definition. And it's a long definition. And what I've written here is the short version of that definition. Because in the definition, they wanted to include not only crops, but also animal. Uh, so the short version is, that precision agriculture or precision farming is the same, is a management strategy, and that's important to remember, uh, that takes account of temporal and spatial variability uh, to improve sustainability of agriculture production. And a key word is variability, because you could argue that all all uh, agriculture um, want to improve st uh, sustainability. And the key for precision agriculture is the variability. You can also call it site-specific farming. There are several um, different words. I personally kind of like site-specific farming because it's easier to understand what it's all about. Uh, and it started about in the early 90s, you could say, and it's developed in the Western world with large farms. So the, the basic or the reason for it is that growing conditions vary, as you may know. Uh, so what this little plant needs uh, it, it's affected by the ability of the soil to keep water, the climate, so if it receives water, the amount of organic matter, the nutrients, uh, the pH, uh, and as I said, the climate. So there are multiple factors that um, <laughs> decides the growing conditions for this particular plant. Some of them is natural, you can call. It's because of you have different soil types. Uh, you, you have different altitudes, different topology, um, and you, you are, have different climates. You can't really, as a farmer, you can't affect the climate. Uh, but then there is also variation that is due to management. Uh, depending on what type of farm you have, do you have animals? Do you have cattle? Uh, what do you have in terms of resource and, and um, fertilization possibilities? There are numerous things that you can affect as a farmer. This is what I would normally show <laughs> to a Swedish farmer or in a Swedish context. But when it comes to this more global context, I think that resources should also be included in the growing conditions. So. The growing conditions vary, and it's quite easy to understand that there's differences between Sweden and Kenya. Different soil types, different climate, and a lot of things are different. Uh, but the fact is that growing conditions can also vary on a rather small scale. I know this is a 20 hectare field, so compared to a small holder with less than one hectare, it's still a large farm or a field. But uh, just try to explain what it shows. These plots here, and I hope you see it now, these plots, these parts of the field have received no nitrogen fertilization, but the rest of the field has received. So 
The difference is here is because the soil cannot deliver as much nitrogen. But in this part, you can barely see the difference between the fertilized and the non-fertilized plot, which means that in this case, the soil can deliver much more nitrogen. And the, the pictures are taken at the same day. It's actually about 100 kilograms of nitrogen difference between what the soil can uh, supply. And this is within one field for Swedish conditions, uh, a not a small, but a fairly small field, and not so far apart. And that's 100 kilograms of nitrogen. And imagine if you're a farmer and you want to know how much fertilizer to apply to your field, you really need to take this into account. What a farmer would normally do, maybe not Eva, but still, and in many places of the world, he or she would look at the average of the field and apply. And in this case, let's say that's 80 kilograms of nitrogen. That means that in parts of the field, it will not be enough. The crop would, to reach its potential, it would need more. And in some parts, it would be too much. The crop has already received enough. And this is the key. Trying to match the demand of the crop is the key to have a sustainable agriculture. Um, this is a picture from a colleague. And I'll try to explain it. It's this curve is uh, um, it's it's the grain yield in response to fertilization. So if you fertilize more, the crop will will grow more until it reach uh, kind of a maximum, and then it doesn't really matter if you add more nitrogen; it will still just be the same. And this curve is what is leaked out in a, so it's a leaching study and the nice thing <laughs> with this is that more or less where you would have your optimum nitrogen fertilization you still have a very low leaching effect but as soon as you over fertilize that is when you start to have problems and this can be other things. This doesn't have to be nitrogen. It can be other nutrients. It's, it's the same when it comes to pesticides and leaching. But the key is to match your input or your management with the need. And the need on every single place. OK, so if you want to match the need of the crop on every single part of your field or plot or whatever, you really need to know what that need is. And that is actually one of the issues. It's not so easy. Uh, you can take soil samples to know a bit about your soil. You can take uh, samples, tissues from your crop to get some uh, information about the status of your crop. But these uh, analyses are quite expensive. Um, and if you want to know it on every single part of your plot and field, you would have to do it numerous times. So it's just not really doable. That is why precision agriculture has come to be connected or related a lot to technology. Because instead of doing this traditional sampling, we try to make use of sensors that are cheaper and easier to use. Uh, it can be remote sensing, like satellite images. Uh, it can be proximal sensing, which means that you have a sensor closer to the, so to the ground. And you can measure soil, and you can measure plant, and try to utilize that information to, to manage your crop. When it comes to animals, you can also use sensors uh, to guide feeding and things. And of course, you can also, I say these are cheaper, but of course, not, not even Ivar would buy one of these sensors on his farm. So it would be more of a, something that you would buy a consultancy service or something. Um, and of course, in another context, 
than the Swedish context, oops, it's even more difficult perhaps. So that was just to give you an idea of precision agriculture. The main thing is to look at the variation and to utilize that information to really match the crop need. But as I said, this is developed in a, in a, in a part of the world where you have large fields. You know, a remote sensing, a, an image from a satellite. It doesn't matter if the resolution is 20 by 20 meters. It's still useful information in Sweden, uh, but perhaps not so much if you're a smallholder in Kenya. That would be mean that that resolution is too, uh, it's not enough. I mean, your, your variation in a much smaller scale. So what can you, what can precision agriculture, uh, how can it help uh, African farmers or smallholders? Well, maybe you should look at the variation a bit different from what we do in Europe. We look at within fields, but here you can look at variation between plots, between fields, uh, between villages or within the village. The, the main thing is to look at the variation. Even in a smallholder context, you will have a large variation. Even in a small scale, you will have it because of this natural variation, but also due to management. And this I've just taken from, uh, from one paper. It's that you can have a quite common pattern is that you have fertile soils close to your homestead. That's where you have, where you put all the inputs. Uh, and then the further away you get, the poorer the soils. But you could actually have the reverse. That is the soil close to home that are poorer compared to the one further away. And that is because of the resource thing. In systems where you have just, usually this would be in a system, sparsely populated system, a lot of, uh, so what you do to keep the fertility in level would be to have a fallow period. You know, the soil need to rest for a while. The input you have is too sparse. So that means that the fields close to home you will kind of overuse them. The thing is with this variation is that it causes variation in um, fertilization response. You know, if you would put the same amount of fertilizer on a fertile field or an unfertile field, you will have different responses. And it's important to know why you have these different responses in order to manage it. There are, of course, some challenges if you want to incorporate precision agriculture ideas uh, in a smallholders context. One quite important thing is the lack of information. Uh, there is a lack of information on uh, your status or what, what your plants need in general. Often, I say not always, but often. Um, there is also a lack of precision agriculture knowledge uh, in general and often also a, a lack of uh, established agronomic services providers, someone who can, who can give this information to the farmers. Uh, Eva talked, there is a lot of resources, but there is also often a lack of resources for the single farmer to be able to, even if he knew what his crop would need it, maybe he could not give it to it because he can just not have, get enough input. Uh, there's also a lack of, you know, you can't really invest in this very expensive technology. Another issue is that many of the government recommendations on how to use the resources, the fertilizers, they do not take into account that there exists local variation. So generally the overall uh, recommendations are very broad. Uh, let's see, I'll just very briefly uh, talk about um, a small systematic research, a systematic map it's like a systematic review uh, that two uh, colleagues, and actually me and Mats, did together. 
it's about just looking at how much research has been done on precision agriculture in Africa. And this is only English literature, so there might be others. Um, and so this is what they found in terms of number of studies. And what you can see is it kind of follows a trend so that more advanced countries with but come a bit further in the advanced technologies and socioeconomics have more research on precision agriculture. Um, a lot of the research so far has been on the mapping, you know, trying to, to, ha do, to map soil fertility, to map crop. Uh, and that is the first stage, so it's not so, so strange. But another thing they find was that based on the authors of these papers, it seems like almost all of the research or a lot of the research has been involving or depending on foreign actors. So there is a potential for African researchers to make this their own area. Um, I started as I talked about challenges, but I also want to say that there are great opportunities and the thing is, to, rec to recognize, I mean, first to, to understand that there is a lot of variation uh, and to understand the cause of this variation uh, in soil fertility and crop growth conditions, that's fundamental if you want to increase resource use efficiency. I mean, with the sparse resources you have, you really want them to make, uh, to be used in the best of ways. Uh, and it's also the, the only way if you want to increase fertilizer response, even on, I mean, on all of your fields, not only on the most fertile ones. Um, and actually, in there are many reports now, quite recent reports, where precision agriculture or precision farming or site-specific farming has been put forward as one of the one of the key solutions to this sustainable intensification uh, goals and for food security. Uh, and in uh, one from IPCC, the special report on climate change and land, uh, in a chapter of about food security, they talk about something they call low-tech precision agriculture, which means that you use the farmer's knowledge and experience rather than all these fancy techniques. Uh, but in combination with innovative approaches. Uh, and they say that it has the potential to increase the economic return per unit land and also to uh, create new employment possibilities. And my last slide will also be that even though these sensors and this technique may be expensive in one way, but it's, it's also actually new, I mean, there are potential innovation possibilities. Um, and I think, as it is now, uh, one of the problem is that uh, all the information uh, that comes from outside uh, or from uh, companies uh, that produce this, big companies or so, that sells it to the smallholder farmer. And the, the, the knowledge gap between the smallholder and the one providing this service is too big. So it's really difficult for them to... Uh, so I think that is something that needs to be uh, managed somehow. Uh, maybe Christine will talk about that. Thanks a lot. Uh, very, also very exciting presentation. I must say, yeah, well, um, we're running a farm here in Sweden, and, uh, and precision farming in the sense has really changed the way we do things, actually, with our resources, and also, also in the sense of, of of getting an economy out of farming, which has had been has been very difficult. And precision farming also not only increasing our, our yields in the sense, but also our efficiency, but also increasing the the, the competitiveness and, and, and um, profitability of farming as well. But the question then is, then, yeah, the question then is, what, what, type, what type of questions do you have to answer yeah. now? <laughs> I have some, but, but do you have any questions? Yes. 
Hello, good morning, everybody. I'm Megis Gilgai, International Foundation for Science. Uh, just to, to fill in the gap that you are opening to say, you know, there is knowledge, but there is a gap between the knowledge and the farmers, and how can you create that possibility of bringing uh, homegrown knowledge, so to say. And that's exactly what my organization is doing, the International Foundation for Science. We try to support young researchers in developing country in the issues that they themselves identify, or there is this type of research gap and we try to support them to develop the capacity, the research capacity, the capacity of analyzing, making research, and creating results. So I think there are ways of, of doing that. Uh, for example, this year we have received around 2,000 applications from developing countries that are really looking for support and the support can be both financial support but also technical support and intellectual support which we try to do it through our international advisors around the world to give them that possibility to grow their capacity in order to respond to these gaps and to generate knowledge and create a sustainability to outside interventions also. So there are possibility, but let's work together. Good, thanks. Any more? I, I thought, when I have one question uh, which is burning in my mind, Johanna, and that is that in, in the precision farming development in Sweden, uh, the very important actor besides the, the providers of the technology are the extension services and, and those institutions developing, bridging the gap between the, the providers and you as a farmer. And, I wonder, and they, they have been quite excellent in Sweden, but I wonder if you have any views on what does it take and, and is the extension services in Africa and the reasons you are, are they up to that sort of challenge in adopting this precision farming agriculture know-how to, to farming? <clears throat> I, I think that is one of the biggest problems or that's one of the problems because my experience doesn't span all of Africa at all but uh, what I have is actually that that is one of the problems. The extension services are neither not that developed really, they are too few, and they are not really up to date in terms of knowledge, um, which means that the farmers get a lot of the information, if any, from a selling company instead. Uh, or, as I wrote, the recommendations are really not at all taking into account the fact that you need to be site specific. Uh, even on, on, on large areas, the recommendations are, we call it blanket recommendations. You kind of say that every farmer in this huge area should put this amount of nitrogen, this amount of phosphorus, and this amount of potassium, or whatever. Uh, and that is so far from, from precision agriculture, which means that, that that is actually a problem. Because if you the advisors, they actually need to, to provide mm -hmm. <laughs> these amounts. Uh, so then maybe one thing could be to make sure that this amount is used in the best way. Yeah. Um, instead of uh, not spreading it just evenly, but at least trying to, uh, to focus. I just want to stress one thing that I stressed in the beginning. And that is that precision agriculture is a management system. So it's not an agriculture system which means that you can, the ideas, you can use them in conventional agriculture, in climate smart agriculture, which is quite similar in many ways, uh, in uh, conservation agriculture, that doesn't matter. The thing is to optimize. Mm. Thanks a lot for, for sort of illuminating the possibilities, the challenges <laughs> uh, and opportunities. You know, we, we come at a stage of this, in this seminar that we, we need to sort of to revitalize ourselves and, and we'll take a very, very short break between the next, between Johanna and Christine, uh, and take a sandwich that we have outside here or there, there as well. Uh, so, our suggestion is that you take your sandwich and something to drink. Yes, everything is out. Yeah, and you come immediately back here <laughs> with your sandwich, with your, with your drink, and, and then we start the next presentations. Uh, so, so in a sense that will be a brown bag. So welcome back to welcome for lunch and welcome back. Right, okay.
I'm now introducing uh, um, the second last speaker, Christine, also from the Agriculture University of Sweden, in uh, in Skara as well, colleague with with Johanna, and and in a sense very deep we are deep we are digging we are sort of uh, uh, yeah diving in a bit more into the the, the prisons of farming technologies into the, into the soil. Yes, so please, Christine. <clears throat> Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm at the Swiss University of Agriculture Science, but also an associate uh, researcher at the, now the Alliance between Biodiversity and the International Center of Tropical Agriculture, the regional office in Africa, which is in, is in the same campus as ISIPE. And um, I will talk about, a bit about soil information and soil information on different scales. So, to begin with, who needs information on soil? Well, there are many, many different um, applications for which soil information is needed as decision support or as input data. For example, policymakers who want a map of uh, soil organic carbon sequestration potential, uh, for environmental monitoring, for example, for land degradation neutrality. Fertilizer producers may want to tailor their fertilizer blends to specific regions and need information on soil properties in that area. All kinds of modeling of crop suitability and uh, hydrological modeling for agricultural planning and so on. <coughs> Soil labs may want to use soil information to decide where to take soil samples to guide different things. And farmers and also extension services and agro-retailers at the smaller scale need to know about the soil in the area to make the right decision on whether to lime, which fertilizer to use, which rate to use or sell or recommend. So there are many stakeholders for, for soil information and the information is needed at many different scales. Some decisions are high level, so you need soil information maybe at global scale, continent, country and also country and for the ones who will actually uh, make the practical decisions was at farm field or within field scale. So, and um, this is just a, an added comment that uh, soil is important for us. It's an important resource and it provides many ecosystem services and uh, taking care of our soils, managing it probably restoring, degrading the soils and so on are important for us to, to reach many of the targets of the SDGs. And in this work, soil information is, of course, important. It's important to know how to measure and monitor soils. Okay, so how to get this soil information that may be needed? One can. Design a soil sampling campaign, go out, take soil samples, take them through the lab, make an analysis and get some information on the properties of the soil. One can also take an instrument, go directly out in the field and measure the soil in situ where it is and get some information on the properties of it. Or one can simply download the information from the web. Because there are now several global digital soil maps available for free at a relatively high resolution with values of many different uh, soil properties like texture, organic matter content, macronutrient contents, pH, micronutrient contents for every 250 meter of the soil across the globe. So the information is there. There are many different products. ISRIC is very 
World Soil Information, situated in Holland, is very active in this area and has published many open digital soil maps available for free. Also the FAO, Global Soil Partnerships, they have made this uh, global map of soil organic carbon. Both of them have a 250 meter resolution. So, the data is there, it is available, it is free, and it is spatially detailed. But is it correct? It's very easy to make a map that looks nice, that looks very detailed, but that's not enough. The values need to mean something. They need to, to say something about how it really is. So we made a little test in six areas of very different sizes in different parts of the world. Uh, Sweden, Rwanda, Namibia and three areas of different sizes in Kenya. In each of these areas we had 50 soil samples analyzed for soil organic carbon content and we downloaded global soil data, in this case soil grids, 250 meter and it was not, they have made a new version of their map so it's not their latest version of the map. And uh, the soil property we were working with was soil organic carbon. So, in these areas, we compared is the map soil organic carbon at the same level as the samples? And in all of these cases, the answer was no. It was a statistically significant difference between the map soil organic carbon and the sample soil organic carbon. So the map often has a bias, it's not on the right level, but it can say, still be correlated to the vari spatial variation of soil organic carbon. So we tested that and in some cases, yes, the map levels values are at the wrong level, but the variation pattern is correlated to what we have observed in the soil. So, in some cases it is, in other cases it was not proven to be statistically significantly related to what we have observed. But, as we had soil samples from these locations, 50 soil samples, that is not very many, at least not in the very big areas, so we used them to combine them with the global data and make an improved map product and in all cases we could improve the accuracy of the map. So if we go, go back to this, uh, the data is there, it's available, it's detailed, but is it correct? I would like to say that it may be correct and it also may not be correct in your local area. And before you use these global soil map products in an area, it's very wise to take some soil samples or compare it with some knowledge of the soil in that area. And if you have a possibility, it's also often very good to use some local samples to make a locally adapted version of the global map so that it's correct in your area. So, how to do this? How to do this in practice? Well, the data is the data is there. You can visit a website and you can download it. You can read an article about the data and about some algorithms to understand how to evaluate it. You can need to install some software, some GIS geographical information system software and maybe some other computational software like R or Python or something and you can analyze your map to see if it is any good or if you need to improve it. This, even if both the software is free and the data is free and the publication is free, it takes some it takes something 
you need to be a specialist in GIS and know how to use these open software. So it's not very easy to do, even if it's available and free. So here I just want to share some experience from different decision support tools for precision agriculture that we have in Sweden. This is a, a satellite-based system for precision agriculture where you can access free Sentinel-2 data. Sentinel-2 is a satellite money, uh, with open data. And you can see an index of your crop status. You can design a prescription file that you use in your tractor and vary the nitrogen rate like Johanna explained before. The, everything is free, so you can do this on your own. You, you can go into this open article and read how to do it and do it yourself. When I checked a little earlier uh, last autumn, about 200 and, uh, 269 people had downloaded that paper, but 20,000 unique users had used the system. So it really makes a difference that it is easily accessible. And the same thing with the parallel system where you instead, here it's not a global soil map, it's a national soil map for Sweden, but you can access it, you can design, for example, how you want to worry seed rate, etc. in relation to that. And same trend here, 300 reads of the article, 5,000 users of the system. So that's why we thought that, okay, now we have these very big global data sets available. We want to, they are a great resource. We want to make them available. So in a collaboration between SLU and SIAT, we, we designed a web-based tool where you can access these maps. So we have downloaded them and put them in the system and you can use them look at them for your area. You can use the variation in the map to select where it's optimal to take some samples. Or if you already have some samples, you can upload results from a sampling and you can get validation statistics for your area and you can get uh, a locally improved map in a much easier way, which we hope is something that will put these maps into practice. Uh, the tool is ready. It's, it's uh, now on SIAT service, but due to some server problems, we are currently moving it to other servers. But, but soon there will be a new web address where you can try it if you like. It's open and available for free. So, okay, this is a system, but such a system can also be seen as a platform form that you can use to develop special applications used for different things. I can take some res present some results here from an agri C literature review or maybe data review because uh, 10,000 data entries were compiled both from unpublished databases and also from literature. And uh, this is mainly Job Kehara at Siat in uh, Nairobi who has led this work. And what he found was that there is evidence of widespread but very varying micronutrient deficiencies across sub Saharan African soils. In many cases, multiple micronutrients are deficient at the same time. Uh, in this study also prices for fertilizer compounds were compiled and an, a profitability analysis was carried out that demonstrated that in, if you don't know anything and apply micronutrient fertilizers, uh, in 60 to 80 percent of the cases it will be profitable to do so because the yield increase that you get uh, overcomes the cost of the fertilizer. And it was also uh, shown that um, the micronutrient content of the 
produce of the grains and uh, the edible parts of the plants increased, so you get a better food nutrition. But it was also found that the effect sizes of this fertilization was very different uh, in different areas with different crop genotypes. So a conclusion was that it is important to vary. It's important with some kind of decision support. You need to know something about your soil so that you know which fertilizers to invest in and whether you need to lime or not first to get the best nutrient use efficiency. So if you, a wish list for future developments of a system like this would be to, to make it possible to do upload used global maps, upload some local samples and get risk maps, for example, for low copper or low pH or low other things. And from that, you can know where to put your money. Do you need to buy a fertilizer containing extra uh, micronutrients or is it enough, enough with an NPK? Uh, another possible uh, future development could be to implement uh, carbon sequestration potential mapping because that is something that many wants to do now to see where if we want to increase carbon content in this area where is it is it the best or largest um, um, potential to increase carbon and where to focus our extension to to obtain this so Oh, that's backwards. Yes, I just wanted to come back to this crop set system because I said it was a Swedish system and that is what it was to begin with, cropset.se. There is another version uh, called cropset.com and that is global. Sentinel-2 goes around the globe so we get imagery from all fields in the world. And... Uh, these are displayed in this system, so if you are interested in a field anywhere in the world, you can zoom in, you can click on the map to define the boundaries, and you can see vegetation indices for that field and how it varies. And if you like, you can use it for precision agriculture or for just information on see how it varies. So that is cropsat.com, and that is available for free. Um, yeah, so really what I wanted to say is that there are a large amount of open data available. It's both soil data, it's also satellite data. Uh, when it comes to the soil data, I would say that it is recommended to compare it with some local observations to see that it's at the right level and it's okay. And if you have the possibility also to use some local samples to improve it locally. Uh, if you are not an expert in the area. And uh, also in general if you want big data to be applied in for small decisions um, at local scale, I think it is a very good idea to package the information and the tools in a very user-friendly way that can be used by any extension officer or farmer or uh, local authority level. So that is what I, I think is important. And uh, when it comes to the system that I have mentioned, the CropSat and the Global Soil Data Manager, uh, these are work in progress and if anyone is interested in some special applications, it, I would be happy to discuss future developments of that. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Susan. A lot of exciting opportunities there as well in soil management. Any questions on that? Yeah. I have a question on, on on, in a sense, the same 
uh, as with Johanna there, uh, in, in Sweden we had we we had uh, some of these companies we call you said data data vext which is a Swedish company mm -hmm. uh, making all this information a lot of this information available in a format that is usable for the farmer in in you in know you know uh, software that they can download in their tractors etc etc and use on the mm -hmm. field <clears throat> uh, very user friendly but but. To what extent do you think it would be possible if you if you look at this African small scale small scale farmer uh, who doesn't have the resources really? Uh, they have the mobile, mm -hmm. of course, which is a good thing. Um, <clears throat> but could they be able to sort of download download and use this this map, maps and? But possibly they would need also some some extension, detailed extension on on that. Or do you think it's it's yeah. explanatory enough? Uh, I think that extension is always a very good thing. So more extension everywhere, yeah. I think. Uh, but uh, I can go back uh, to here. Um, well, it's difficult in a heterogeneous landscape to provide local data that is valid for from global measurements to make it valid locally. So some local measurements are always good but if you are in a village this is a village in uh, western kenya and so there are many farmers and if half of them take a soil samples and said to the lab you can make a map from that and from that map also farmers in between have some use of it because there are yeah. general trends in the landscape so um, I think that, um, yeah, you can, uh, an extension officer in that area could uh, um, organize some uh, joint efforts to get a good local <coughs> data that everyone can have use of, even if not everyone have an own soil sample. Good. Possibly, for example. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. It was, it was an excellent presentation. I remember uh, working with farmers in their farmers' field in the northern part of Ethiopia, in Tigray. Uh, it was not even 200 meters, and the farmers could identify, I think, a range of soil kinds, you know, like about six of them, and they could tell me what to plant there, the kind of disease that attacks their soil. It's detailed information because they have their experience and also the inherited knowledge mm -hmm. of their parents. Um, this is a very good and expert knowledge, but mm -hmm. how much does this knowledge uses the knowledge of farmers? How much the knowledge from mm -hmm. the people is integrated into <coughs> this kind of knowledge? Or is it, or you know, the farmers uh, downloading the, you know, so it's time to Yeah. The bottom up to the, the bottom top down. down. Yeah. Where, where is yeah. the learning between the two? Yeah. Knowledge? I, uh, what you say is very important. Farmers already know their soil yeah. in many ways. So, and the, you have pointed out a missing link here. In the systems available now, there is not much connection between measured large scale data and farmers' local knowledge. And there, I think also that the extension officers have a great role to play, to interpret maps with respect to local knowledge and make the best of the two together. And I know research is going on in many different institutes that uh, try, to, try to make use of farmers' own data in a better way. In, decision making combined with measurements and yeah, yeah. so it's important a uh, great resource right <clears throat> i think we have to move on thanks a lot thanks. christine uh, so <clears throat> while patrick is entering the scene um just fr frame it so that we have talked a lot now about technologies and know-how for small-scale farming systems and now yeah right we're going to change gear to let's, uh, let's just get that in. It should be there. That, that's the one. That's the one. <clears throat> Good. 
so, so what about you know developing an enabling system framework, right? And uh, well, yeah, really good. We need to put on this. Okay. Uh, there, and you need to let's see if that. And breathe normally. Breathe normally. Yes. Does it work? In uh, so. I give the, the scene to Patrick from uh, the Swedish Patent uh, Authority um, to talk about intellectual property in support of agricultural innovation in Africa. Please, Patrick. Thank you very much uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, um, first of all, I have to thank all the speakers before me. I mean, uh, coming from a government agency, working as, as Eva uh, referred to with how the government can enable innovation and enable creativity. I'm always humbled with all the impressive innovations because I am a simple bureaucrat uh, and I sit at my desk and turn a lot of papers. Um, I would also like to thank the, invit from the invitation from the Stockholm Environment Institute and the reason why I'm here uh, I suppose is because I am uh, in charge of the capacity development that we are working uh, with at uh, Swedish Patent and Registration Office. And we have worked for like more than 40 years with different kind of, of capacity development, mostly funded by the Swedish Development Corporation Agency, SIDA. Uh, and uh, for a few years, uh, we have had a special program uh, that thematically work um, uh, towards uh, supporting uh, innovation in uh, in genetic resources, mo mostly in agriculture, and we are doing that. Uh, uh, and all the co all the um, trainings we have had uh, for the 40 years have been in cooperation with a new agency called WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization. But since uh, three years ago, we when we started with this new training on genetic resources, we also teamed up with some Swedish partners. Siani is one of the Swedish partners because they know a lot of things that we don't. Uh, and also SLU, the Swedish uh, Agriculture Science University, as well as uh, we affect uh, of the Swedish partners in this training. And uh, I, I, uh, I catch something that 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 uh, the director general Sigurd uh, Kilimen said in the beginning, and that was policy matters. And many things that we are doing uh, in our trainings are directed to policymakers uh, and are directed to senior uh, researchers or people in the ministries to make them understand intellectual property and why intellectual property can support innovation and creativity and uh, so they can make informed decisions depending on national circumstances or regional circumstances or international circumstances. As uh, Eva said, uh, I'm from the Swedish Patent and Registration Office. Our main task is not at all trainings. Our main task is to uh, give patents, give trademarks, and tr give tra designs. And we've been around since 1885, so it's quite old authority. Uh, and for Sweden, at least, uh, uh, the intellectual property system uh, have worked very well to support innovation for that time, and that's suppose that's why we're still around. Uh, so uh, I will try to uh, see how this works. Okay, so now I understand. So this is um, one value chain on on uh, from innovation to uh, investment to applied innovation. And uh, s since I gather that most of you are um, researchers uh, and so on, uh, and this is of course very. This is of course not at all how it works in reality, <laughs> because you know all the lines go back and forth and, and a lot of other things. But uh, if you would like to put put it in a, minis a minimalistic way, uh, uh, it's like we start with research and development, and uh, to. Uh, Start with research and development, you need uh, financial support funding, you need uh, access to knowledge and access to technology and so on. And then, uh, if at least if you are as ingenious as the speakers before me, you will uh, work and then you will generate intangible assets such as knowledge. 
uh, and that is, uh, for instance, um, yeah, all the you know what knowledge is. It's, it's, it's the information, for instance, that were generated with, regarding the soil. It, it's it's also. Uh, Gannett's trust. If you are uh, well-renowned researchers, for instance, and you publish a lot, then you get, get you get trusted, and in a way, uh, you, you get uh, uh, a brand, and that could be a brand for your research institute, or it can be a brand for for yourself, and so on, and 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 so on. So SLU, I would guess, is a very strong brand, and ICP is a very strong brand when it comes to research. And then that is all fine. But if you would like to go the next step, and, and be honest, uh, intellectual property uh, serve a few purposes. One purpose is, and most important, I would guess, is, is, is uh, commercialization. The object of intellectual property is to commercialize something. If you would like to have uh, commercialization uh, of your product, then you should apply for some sort of intellectual property. But that is not all the truth. Another issue is uh, for the one who are doing the research is of course also to have control. And that is, uh, we've seen examples throughout uh, history and I met different research institutes around the world where they have done very much research, they have done tremendous research that have been benefited a lot, many people, but they're not gaining the, the, uh, the, the 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 benefits from their research or or for instance i was in a, in a central america i was at a research institute they had uh, in, they had worked in towards uh, the global south they had uh, extremely good research uh, in a very specific area and they gave it all away uh, and they developed new technologies uh, to to extract these certain substances and it was amazing uh, and 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 um, they thought, since we are working towards the global south, we don't uh, patent anything, we don't do anything about it. And they appeared, and then they realized that, uh, and they did all the good thing for for the, uh, Latin America and Africa and so on. But they didn't. Then, then they saw that it, uh, the the research ended up also in the global north i mean in companies in in the us or in companies in 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 in, in europe where, where uh, they could earn a lot of money uh, from uh, development that um, this research institute had uh, had done themselves while if they had been a little bit forward thinking and protected their uh, innovations they would have had possibilities to to earn money and also uh, in reinvested that in the, all the good things they did. And I also have another example from Bangladesh. Again, uh, it's amazing research. There, I mean, the, the, they're the best. And actually, that's I I can tell. It's ICDDRB. It's a public health uh, institute, and we've just recently uh, we're still working with, but we are try, starting to finalize a, a project with them where where we are helping them develop an, an intellectual property policy uh, and, and they have had for like 60 years developed amazing research and I think they have apply, applied for one patent and in hindsight they could say that if we would have had like a, a, a fraction of the money that these research have have uh, have generated, we would have been in much better position because they still have to struggle for 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 getting funding for all the research. Uh, a lot about um, the rationale about intellectual property. Uh, and what is it? Um, uh, I don't have a clock here, so please stop me if I, uh, when, I'm fin when it's time for me to stop. These are the intellectual properties. And, and uh, in agriculture, uh, I would say, um, I mean, all of them are important. Patents is the traditional one, it's for technical developments. Uh, plant variety protection, if you develop a new plant, that could be an option. Trademark, you know, uh, famous trademarks like, uh, I don't know, I Ikea or H&M and so on. That's, I was recently in Uganda and, and, and at the university there and they said, the first thing, if you would like to go to a business, is to apply for a trademark because uh, that defines your product and your service 
uh, in a way so other people uh, can use it. And trademark is also actually, it could also be used as an example uh, for small home farmers. One shining example uh, of, of uh, achievements is, is the Ethiopian coffee, it, it, it mentions a lot. And they are applied for a tr three different or four different trademarks for uh, uh, Ethiopian uh, coffee, which is so they didn't, they did, wasn't, so the Ethiopian co coffee wasn't a uh, commodity uh, anymore, but also a specific commodity. So when I, when buyers went, they they did they wanted to have went to the store or the uh, Starbucks in specific, they wanted this, this specific coffee and that rendered a, a value increase of, 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 of that specific coffee from, I think it was, I'm not familiar with all this US um, uh, measurements, it's like from $1.5 uh, uh, per pound to $3 per pound or something like that. So it's amazing. Uh, geographical indications is also one thing that could use, be used for, 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 for smallhold farmers. Uh, if traditionally, geographical indication is like champagne or, 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 or Parma ham and so on, but it can also be used to protect uh, meat products from uh, parts of Africa or meat products from somewhere else. I'm feeling I'm uh, copyright is uh, the main intellectual every researcher i'm sure uh, if they write an article then there is the copyright issues come uh, come at hand if you are generating uh, information you gather information in a database copyright issues come at hand uh, so that is uh, intellectual property a little bit and to put it then in this value chain it's it's it's, it's um, it's the same um, picture, but in another way. Then, when uh, you are a researcher and you would like to have access to information or access to knowledge, you write. Maybe you write a research agreement or cooperation agreement with with a with a, a university, someone else, or or with a company, someone else. You need to have intellectual property uh, in the back of your head uh, when you generate intangible assets. As I said, copyright, patents, if you develop a new plant, plant variety protection is uh, very important in selection properties. And when you put it on the market, uh, trademarks, designs, how things look, uh, patents and plant variety protection are also very important. And that's why uh, for researchers, uh, uh, IP is, is important for two reasons. Uh, first reason is to make access to knowledge uh, and to protect research result. Uh, and then research institutions also need to have knowledge about IP, uh, which we are more and more uh, being aware of uh, throughout the world. And, and I meet uh, many research institutions in Africa who, who also express this. Uh, that is to make a strategic decision on uh, research and commercialization. I'm not saying uh, and, and that could be a misconception I noticed in some research uh, organizations that the thing is that we should have this amount of patents so this uh, you, we should apply for 100 packages a year or, or something like that. That is not an issue. I mean, maybe you won't apply for not any patent, but at least you would make an informed decision on what and when uh, to apply for. And then it's also important to manage intellectual assets and for contracts and license in research cooperation. Uh, so far, I haven't talked at all uh, or in, to a, lot, a very little extent to uh, smallhold farmers because, and, and, and the reason is of course for uh, that main like traditional innovation is made maybe not uh, in, in small hole for it but in cooperation with uh, research institutes uh, but uh, that there are still uh, areas where where um, the the knowledge maybe not of, of at, uh, at each and every farmer is important but maybe for the uh, uh, for for cooperatives and so on it's important to know intellectual property to make uh, uh, 
import, uh, to make uh, commercial decisions for, for the cooperative, but also to be able to influence policy. As we started out here, the policy do matter, and then we have to have people informed in intellectual property on all levels to not uh, make wrong decisions or, or uh, not so beneficial uh, de decision. And I, I will illustrate that with the next slide, I thought. Now something happened, so I try here instead. Uh, something has happened. Oh, there. magic. Uh, so this is uh, the example I take is 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 uh, plant development, plant breeding. So uh, don't don't matter. What I try to illustrate here is, of course, that you ha take something small, tiny, and make something more useful. And and then uh, in general. In mo many countries, if this is done by genetic engineering, you could have patenting. Not in Africa, though. Uh, most African countries don't. Or you can have a plant variety protection if it's a uh, plant variety. And as I mentioned, you can also, and that is very common, for instance, for ornamental plants, if you're, you're producing, that is not for food, which is the subject of today, but then if you have ornamental plants, trademarks and branding are also important, as well as geographical indications and uh, uh, copyright information and databases uh, are also. So these are the uh, wide variety of intellectual property that can uh, be, be uh, relevant. But on the other hand, uh, here, is if you're developing, now I'm not in the camera, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, on the other side, uh, to make development within uh, uh, genetic resources or plant genetics, you need to have input. And the input is, of course, something that you find in the wild and also something that you can find on farms. And on farms, it could be smallhold farmers, it could be, the, in the, so it's it have an aspect of indigenous knowledge. And then we come to the next slide, which uh, demonstrates that, um, that it's a much more complicated policy landscape when it comes to intellectual property. It's not only uh, to apply your patent or not, you have to consider conventional biodiversity and where, where they have uh, things about traditional knowledge, uh, as well as uh, the FAO International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, where uh, they, are, they are regulating what and how to, to apply for, to get genetic resources that will, uh, will uh, eventually end up in commercial product. And those clearly, those two conventions clearly say that traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and indigenous knowledge holders that have this kind of knowledge should be a knowledge and should also uh, have a say on what will happen to the product later. So this is a much more complicated landscape and I said, than I said before. And also, I mentioned uh, intellectual properties such as uh, patents and so on. In Africa, uh, especially in the part where, which I know a little bit more about, uh, the eastern and, and the southern uh, area, Aripo, which is uh, a regional office on intellectual property, they also administer a traditional knowledge protection system in Africa. And that traditional knowledge protection system is still to be implemented. And, 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 and when implementing that, this also will can have an uh, effect on the intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So my next slide now turns to the pr the object of my discussion, which was uh, our pr uh, the training we had together with Siani, uh, uh, for instance, and still a little bit challenging to magic. Okay. So what I'm trying to say with my first slides and the reason why we are doing. Uh, with the funding of Swedish uh, uh, Development Corporation uh, Agency, why are we doing uh, trainings in intellectual property? Well, because of the central uh, uh, role of agriculture for livelihood to creating wealth, to make new technologies available, for instance. And that is a challenge we have mentioned earlier today. Uh, and we see that intellectual property can uh, play a role, and especially I think it's important uh, th that 
consideration relevant for smallhold farmers need to be considered so they will, will not be left behind. And then the second, the complex and po uh, evolving policy landscape for innovation in agriculture. That was the picture I showed you before. It's not only uh, the TRIPS agreement, which is the WTO, World Trade Organization um, agreement, but it's also um, uh, the Convention on Biodiversity and the Nagoya Protocol, who is uh, about to be implemented, the implementation of the FAO Treaty and, uh, and others. Uh, it's also to, and that's why we do this, to bridge different interests for local, national, regional, international level. And uh, we believe that the sustainable development is important uh, through national ownership. Uh, the next slide shows the different target groups we have in our trainings in this. It's farmer organizations, government, research institute, business and seed companies. And we have also seen, by doing these kind of trainings, uh, we avoid some of the silos because, we, and I, will, I can tell you now, uh, for instance, in Zambia, uh, we had one project uh, where, uh, where there was a, a peop people from an uh, educational institute uh, for smallhold farmers. They had a project where they taught, uh, where they put together uh, people from industry in Zambia, people from, from, from uh, small home farmers, people from research, and they had never met before. And even people from the two different ministries, they didn't, they was, wasn't aware that, okay, my, what I am doing is, is, is important for, for my, what I am doing on intellectual property is important on the seed system or, or on the, or, or, or on the implementation on Nagoya. And they haven't met before. So, so this, it's a, and, and it's the same, I mean, I would say, I, I would say it's the same in Sweden and, and in the rest that, that, that people in different areas doesn't talk to each other. And I think that's a big, uh, challenge, but also an opportunity if we succeed. Anyway, so this is my last slide with some, uh, of the examples of, uh, pr projects that we have done. The first one is the outreach for smallhold farmers in Zambia. Actually, we had two Zambian projects. The other one was, was, talk about intellectual property for, for traditional knowledge holders and they were using uh, I haven't seen it on video unfortunately but they use they were using mm -hmm. plays and dances to teach intellectual property which would, which would have been much more fun for you to see if I could have done that and then another one is trademark uh, in cotton industry it's it's uh, uh, it's a farmers co um, cooperative uh, who have done trademark uh, uh, a trademark project where they have realized that since uh, India, who's doing a lot of uh, textiles, they're using uh, Ugandan uh, cotton because it's very good, but they haven't really acknowledged that Ugandan cotton is something special. So that is one of the project. Another program is, is a project is uh, the ABS Access and Benefit Sharing Guidelines in Malawi. A uh, very good uh, project. Again, people from research and people from government met and they like interacted to support innovation better. Uh, patent information handbook for research in Kenya. Uh, I won't go into details. This one, the last one is actually uh, an exceptionally good project, I would say. Uh, unfortunately, it's very technical, but it has to do with, 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 with um, with gathering genetic information from different species. So the first project was uh, from Indonesia, where they got it uh, from chili pepper, and they also had a lot of money from World Bank, so they were very good equipped to provide this uh, knowledge database, and they have started cooperating with, with researchers in Mozambique, in Uganda, in uh, uh, Zambia, and in Tanzania on gather genetic information and then use it for, and that is the idea. I mean, the, in, only the Indonesians so far have had uh, also the experience of going out to the farmers and say, what kind of property or trait do you need? And then they have started to develop uh, based on the genetic information to try to develop specific crops for that purpose. So it's super interesting and, and, and as uh, was referring to before, projects takes a lot of time and that's why we, this is only like the, the beginning, I hope, uh, of, a, of a much further impact. And I'm, I'm sorry, I talked very fast 
and very technical, and uh, I'm open to questions now or later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick, for a rich and interesting, uh, illuminating story, uh, uh, well, the seminar on IPR and farmers and innovation. Any f questions? I can start with a comment because I think, you know, I talked about, uh, you know, how to, in, 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 in the world of bioeconomy, in East Africa and bioeconomy, how, for, how the region can really go from R&D innovation, upscale that into commercialization, really make an impact. And I think, in that extent, IP is crucial because uh, <clears throat> you have to have a feeling for who owns what, what can you do with the resource, you have to enter into collaboration agreements between uh, organizations, between companies, uh, between countries, uh, and, and in, do, in making a, an agreement, if I make an agreement with Patrick here, we have to know, do you own that, I own that, this we own together, mm. this we do together will be owned by these ones. There's a lot of IP mm. issues in there. In there. Um, and also, which usually the US patent system is, is they have a different sort of momentum there, but they always say, you know, IP is benefiting the society in the sense that if we all publish freely, there will be very little commercialized because if things are available on net, nobody, oh, just freely, nobody, and, and you, that is not patentable, and nobody, no organization or no private company would say, I will invest $10 billion in, in developing this because then somebody else can take the exact information and copy all that, and, and that information cannot be protected. So by, by you know, safeguarding uh, your, your property, intellectual property, you're also enabling that private sector investment and that sort of commercialization. With that, sort of, we, we are, yeah, so that's, that's a comment and quest, a question. <laughs> well, I, 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 I wouldn't say it's either or, you no. can have both, yeah. uh, to put it short. And also, uh, I mean, there are definitely, uh, for most research, there's definitely uh, the, the issue of, of publish uh, is very important, but yeah. still that's also an IP issue, as I mentioned, it's copyright. And also, also, I mean, all these creative commons and all this open, everything has IP issues because it's, it's still some sort of controlled uh, intellectual property and you know, controlled copyright in that sense. So I think yeah. everything is very important, but, but for innovation and, and putting things on the ground, uh, intellectual property is important. Yeah. Please. Yes, please. I have a question, but it is uh, to Signet if she is around. Oh, Signet had to, she, 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 she had to excuse oh. herself because she is, she is going to this ceremony and she had to leave. Okay, because she's just uh, mentioned about the, the, the did research on producing a repellent for CC fly. Mm -hmm. And she just presented, yeah, that is the product, that is it. In fact, my question, my, how they work really with uh, protecting the rights of commercializing that mm. repellent. It can be protected by the research and being published in the nature, but it would be really interesting to see how mm. the institute mm. is working with commercializing that repellent. It will be used within Africa, of course, but... Uh, I was also very interesting <laughs> to answer, uh, 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 to ask her that. But, but, I, but I think I, think mm. I, can, I can answer, a bit, not mm. on, on, on Seganet's behalf, but I think we discussed it a bit uh, yesterday with the Segnet, and they say, she says that they have an IP uh, office at ESIPE. So what they do is they, uh, they, they do IP on their key technologies. But the problem is like university or research institutions are usually not the best commercial exactly. entrepreneurs. <clears throat> and they realize that. So what they do is licensing that technology. And you can license, you know, even you can do a, discussionary, what do you call it? No, uh, Non-exclusive or non-exclusive. Non exclusive. Exclusive. You can say to somebody mm -hmm. that this is your license, take it and that you can use it, only only you can use it, or you, you do a non-exclusive license that every private company that that, mm -hmm. that asks for permission can use it. But they're working with, through licenses. So the IP is, is certainly a, an important part of, of the portfolio of ECPM. So they, they are mm -hmm. there and they're working actively with IP. The, the, the difficulty for ECPM and for East Africa and for also for small scale farmers is how to get that commercial interest and that venture capital mm. to be invested in, in commercial and upscaling mm. solution. And then 
that's it's a chicken and egg problem. So that it's a buying capacity of the farmers. Mm. It's a buying capacity of the of the of the consumers of the farmers' product or the biobased product. So when that when that demand mm. is there, the interest of of investment is there. So I think the momentum is 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 increasing in our, in, in in the region a lot. But but there's still this challenge. Mm -hmm. Johanna, I, I just have a question. How would you? Incorporate because I think that's interesting. How would you incorporate this? Um, do you call it indigenous, indigenous knowledge, knowledge. Or, or the fact that you know you find a crop that is specifically owned, cropped by a few farmers in a specific area which seems to be very nice? How would you actually do that? In sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that question, uh, because it's not easily made, I would say. I mean, the, you can look at it in a different way. I mean, traditional intellectual property is that as long as something is not known, uh, then you can protect it, while in this case, uh, this plant could be known and still uh, could be protected. So actually, I, I, I'm not sure if I uh, can answer directly of that. I think what, because that is one of my, I, I work only 25% with this, there are, uh, 75 with this, 25% I do some uh, international negotiation and I have been participating for the last almost 20 years in exactly that discussion on how to protect uh, traditional knowledge on an international level and, and, and I'm not sure and just back that we have discussed this for 20 years is of course one indication that it's not so easy but the other in, uh, what we are what <laughs> the, they are looking more I'm, I'm participating mostly in other parts is that looking at different levels of, of depending on if something is sacred and very holds very close to this traditional uh, community or indigenous community then there would be one level of protection while for for something that is publicly known and while it spread then would probably be some protection of less extent only maybe mentioning that this uh, uh, knowledge der originally derived from somewhere but it's a very very delicate discussion and also um, and it also touches upon I mean other areas of conservation and, and what is the purpose of a protection is it like to have an intellectual property style protection or is there something else uh, that was a long uh, non answers <laughs> <laughs> thank you um, my answer uh, you mentioned the, the Africa Regional Intellectual Property mm. Organization Aripo yes uh, the African civil society is quite unhappy with the uh, Aripo, uh, as you probably know, uh, because they we feel that they are not representing the interest of uh, African farmers uh, when they are pushed by international seed companies to really take Africans into the UPO. 94 agreement. No, oh, you're very <laughs> skilled in, in the background. I mean, yeah. UPO 91 yeah. is very like yeah. Yeah. hardcore yeah. IP. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> what's your view? I mean, the view of government on that. Oh, <laughs> the view of my government. Uh, uh, that's very, I mean, uh, that's a very good question. I mean, it's, it's, but also, I mean, I've been, I've been to recently, last year I was in Zambia and Uganda, and that was two countries where this has been discussed uh, mm -hmm. to some extent. And I, I, I and, 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 uh, I would, I mean, I don't have any strong views on particular organizations or, 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 or so, but I think that it's, it's getting more and more aware of, uh, of the problems around that you cannot uh, imply certain areas. So, for instance, with the implementation of, 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 of the, now, uh, uh, of the implementation of the UPO agreement in Zambia, I think they had like this, uh, threshold so if, if the farm is less than a certain size then you're not affected and stuff like that mm. but that is like there are different ways to balance uh, uh, out like the, the quite rigid uh, UPOV style protection which is I suppose mostly f uh, focusing for for large-scale farming and, and also but on the other hand to put a plant right protection scheme at place in a country is one way of creating a market, uh, so to say, because uh, so, so, so the, in, in the research institutes at the, that particular country and, and may, may, may have someone who 
so they can get the money back if they have done some research and so on. So it's a, like a, it's a very very difficult balance to do. Uh, I would say. <clears throat> I think I think also it it is that careful balance between mm -hmm. between the you know, private sector and public sector, and in countries in a sense, India is a good example. They had a very strong public sector, breeding sector, and initially they said, well, we'll we'll develop our own you know, uh, plant variety protection, which is very tailored to our system, because we have an extremely strong breeding sector, public sector. We pump up a lot of varieties and a lot of technologies for farmers, and we do that, and the, the government do that, and you can question to what extent, but they, they're doing it. They have a very good system. Uh, but if you don't have a very, very, very strong public, and China is doing the same, mm -hmm. Uh, if you don't have a very, very strong system of public support uh, breeding system, then who is going to provide the new varieties if not the public sector? Then you need private companies. And if you want to have private companies into your into the arena, then some type of protection, some type of IP managed uh, well IP protection is needed. And then you can discuss the forms of that and, and mm. you know the limits and all that. But it's 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 good to think about that balance between in, 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 in where I think you, you, we desperately need innovation, we desperately need these private sector actors to get in there because we, we also recognize that governments can't do it all. <coughs> the public sector has its limits. It's, a, it's wonderfully powerful, it's needed, but it has its limits. So I think, I think IP, if we do it right, and, and I think the course which the period you guys are doing is really developing that sort of arena for 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 the, the the participant to go home and and to and use those tools to apply the IP management to their own conditions for their own development mm. needs. Yeah, that's the the that's the idea yeah. at least. Yes. So so it it it's it's an issue that's certainly there. And you know you, the hardcore scientists, you know, they find it difficult these days to go to Peru or to go to Zambia. And collect information because they are not allowed to unless they have that authority um, mm. um, uh, certificate or, or the the the, uh, the authority to do so. But and, and because in the CBD, all genetic resources belong to the country or a specific um, you know actor within the country, or, or it, it belongs to the country. So you, so if, if SLU, Johanna and Christine, you're going there to collect data. In theory, you need you need that permission. To do so, it's, it's a much more complex world. Uh, you know, we have we found our we have Linnea here, and Linnea he wouldn't be, he, Linnea, he would been he would be banned mm. <laughs> in all the countries they visited. visited. Mm. You can't come, just come here and collect stuff and bring home the, that information. So so it's and and, and uh, for good and for bad. Mm. Uh, also, so that's the new situation we're And so how to use that. And, but, and you can also say that countries which has extremely strong protection also, you may be the barriers too high and nothing is happening. You know, mm. you don't have any innovation. Nobody starts to, to, to enter into collaborative agreements. So it's a, mm. it's a balance. Any more questions? Issues? Anything on innovation? Yeah, because there was the intention of a panel, so I suppose the, the yeah, no, the panel, the, the panel is basically we. Us. Okay, we are we the panel. We are okay. the panel. <laughs> you guys are the panel, and we are the panel. In a sense, the, the speakers were the panels, and, mm -hmm. and so we we. Uh, so I guess at this stage, I mean, we don't have there are a few minutes left. But are there anything that we, as a panel, and you as as um, audit, uh, <clears throat> would like to raise concerning innovation for small scale farming? Uh, in Africa, what, 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 uh, that we haven't touched on, on and, the, and you feel is urgent that we need to raise. Mm -hmm. oh, you need a mic. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentations. Were very interesting, and I think you could not not comment about this outbreak of locust in Africa because it's related to everything we are talking here. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to know your point of view about this, about this locust invasion in Kenya and everywhere. Ah, okay. mm -hmm. And uh, like, uh, which way could you deal with that and how to prevent this kind of uh, situation with a lot of loss in the countries and that we know that's going to come more and more 
uh, with this changing climate and everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, maybe I can start very shortly. I think local innovation is key, and I think local innovation, using using um, the knowledge that is already there. We talked about the farmers; they know their fields, they know their their their, their soils, but also we have a lot of knowledge within the farming and and the and the sort of bioresource utilization arena in the region. But I also think that we do need that collaboration, uh, uh, globally collaboration with partners elsewhere to sort of um, uh, collectively bring that in innovation into, in, 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 into the market. The problem I think sometimes is, or often in Eastern Africa, is that we have a lot of really fantastic R&D uh, and innovation, and it's very much demand driven. Uh, we can we, we can stand the whole a couple, a whole week here and and just develop you know a list of fantastic projects in East Africa and in, in indeed in Kenya and each of the countries. But the problem is that most ends up in a very small scale or limited scale. Most ends up on the shelf. Mm. Very little is deployed on large scales. So you can so to, to a large extent you have a lot of innovation which is demand driven, but very very little which is business driven. So, if you ask me, my, my I'm not saying that is the SAI's view, but my view is that we need a huge surge of, of, of investment into that deployment. And that might be private sector, it might be governmental, it might be sort of, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, cooperatives, but, but that investment is needed. And, and to, to, re, to to, to, to benefit from all the opportunities and meet all the challenges. As you said, climate change is coming. It's coming rapidly. So our resource effectiveness and our, our ability to improve, improve on our yields and, and use all that waste, fantastic, all the amount of residues that are produced in, in, the, in the region for new purposes are immense, you know. So, so I think, yeah, we need that business-driven approach as well. So that's my view. <clears throat> Anybody else? You? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. One one question about the bioeconomy and the strategy for uh, East Africa, uh, which um, you mentioned something about the finding local market as a niche, but still I found East Africa is uh, uh, suffering from the imbalances of the trade between other African countries. Mm. In East Africa, it's very common to find horticultural products from from South Africa mm. and not being produced locally. Is there anything really about how not to protect the market, but how the East the East strategy can consider protecting the farmers in East Africa when it comes to trade issues related to <coughs> Those products. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a trade expert. I think maybe Patrick, you're more in, in, into trade than I am. But I, but I think in general, uh, you know, within East Africa, there are the East African community and and the trade agreements within the AC. And then, as I said, you have you have uh, uh, the IPCAD mm -hmm. trade agreements within IPCAD, which includes Ethiopia as well. Uh, and I think within also, the, I mean, that's. All those trade agreements has their details and and their and their provisions, um, but I, and I and I think that sort of protection of the local market is always there as an issue. My view is, is that maybe maybe I think that well that if you protect yourself too much, you also protect yourself from that influx of, of investment and, and, and knowledge and know-how. So maybe my view would be to, instead of invest in that local production, production make it more competitive on, on an African market, on a regional market. That would be my approach. But I'm, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to the strategy, it's, not, it's the region that will decide on what, you know, what, what uh, policy decisions within that trade you need to take. That's my view. But, oh, sorry, you need that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I just have a short comment on the trade issues. Uh, you mentioned that earlier too, as uh, an increase in uh, global trade would change the situation quite a lot. But the EU now 
is making it more difficult to for to mm. Africa to export. Mm. And there is another issue that's very uh, much related to what you discussed uh, a second ago, is that the first of July we have a free trade area in the whole of uh, Africa. Mm. So that's actually changed your whole discussion mm. about mm. what trade could be, because that will be free trade mm. between the countries and. I'm not sure anyone can even, you know, imagine what that will, uh, what the consequences or the opportunities will mm. be for that. It is hard to imagine. It yeah, is yeah. very difficult to to see. And um, we working um, at the SSNC, we working with um, support to farmers uh, to transform to ecological farming. And uh, that might be a fantastic opportunity to, mm. you know, to export uh, mm. um, ecological products to other countries uh, in Africa. Or it might be uh, really tricky. Mm. So, mm. so we, we have to stop talking about countries, trade of countries, or because we have the whole continent now will be open in a couple of months. I agree. Yeah, <clears throat> I think one 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 element of that is that sometimes you know that there's very high import tariffs in the region on machinery, which serves the purpose, of course. But the problem is, in processing various type of, of ag uh, agriculture material, you need machinery and equipment, and sometimes it's very very expensive for African entrepreneurs to to buy that machineries uh, on the market because of. Uh, Partly because of these import tariffs, so that's also a free trade issue yeah. in a sense. So it's 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 a sort of, and I think you know, ecological production. I think it, it it's great, and I think in a sense, as as Patrick was saying, that, that you know, to load that with value enough to, to have mm. a trade market, and, and and it would be attractive. It should be attractive mm. on on the European market. And well, also, there are, there are, I mean, there are examples like. You know, co cooperatives, the small hold farmer in Ghana who have developed a chocolate, and then you, and all those steps on reaching the market. But of course, it it all comes down to business in in a way, and how to sell in your brand and how to market yourself, and and also understand what the consumer need. One connection with the bioeconomy is that uh, the horticulture market, market in East Africa, beans, for example, exported to Europe, has one of the barriers has been that, that there has been high level of pesticides residues in them. And now there's a fantastic development that use much more biopesticides and have reduced the level of residues. So much of the bean export in Kenya now is meeting the import or the, the standards. So it's a positive development and that's, you know, it's part of the whole scheme. So one achievement in, in the areas of biopesticides also means achievements on, on, on one commodity production in, in Kenya and also, you know, for, for, for markets and trade. Well, if that's, I think we, we, we're coming to a close. We have ten, 10 minutes past. Thanks a lot for all the presenters, for fantastic presentations, and for you as audience being very patient with us and and asking clever questions. And to you, the audience, the web audience, thank you. Can thank you for downloading, and hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks. Thank you.